Hello. Welcome. <laughs> On behalf of the TEDx Ithaca College team, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone in the audience here today and everyone watching online via live stream. We're so glad you could all join us. We have an incredible lineup of speakers here with us today, innovators and thought leaders from IC, the greater Ithaca area and beyond, and we're so excited for them to share their passions with you. But first, we have just a few announcements. For those who don't know, TEDx Ithaca College is a student-run organization dedicated to bringing revolutionary ideas to Ithaca's campus through conferences just like this. Each TEDx conference has a theme that ties its content together, and this year our 10 esteemed speakers will be sharing with us their take on the theme of empowerment. Now to explain a bit more about what TEDx is and what it stands for as an institution, here is a very brief video. Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. A few more things we'd like to mention before we begin. On behalf of the TEDx IC team, I'd like to thank the college's Student Governance Council for providing the resources necessary to make this conference a reality. None of this would have been possible without their support, and they have our deepest thanks. Thank you. <laughs> During the entirety of today's event, please be respectful and turn off your cell phones. In case of emergencies, please note the exit signs to your left. If you need to leave the room for any reason, uh, exit through the doors. We encourage you to wait until intermission or the space between speakers when possible, as opposed to leaving mid-presentation. But uh, we also recognize that this is a college and it's 10 a.m. on a Saturday, so statistically there are probably some people who overslept and will be coming in late. Uh, so those doors may be opening a little bit, but we are going to uh, do our best. We'll be working to keep that experience up here undistracted from. Uh, you may notice the playing cards beneath your seats. Uh, please leave them there for the time being. Their purpose will be revealed in time. The schedule for today is as follows. Our first five speakers will present this morning from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Then at noon, we'll take a one-hour intermission and lunch will be served. Uh, at one o'clock, we will reconvene for the final five speakers and the conference will end with just a few closing remarks. All right, so without further ado, our first presenter this morning is Dr. Luke Keller. Dr. Keller has been a member of the Ithaca College community for 20 years, 18 of those as a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He is the co-writer and co-star of The Effects of Gravity, a performance of equal parts poetry, music, and astrophysics. And he is currently writing a book on the importance of public science awareness. Without further ado, here is Empowered by Science, Rethinking Public Science Literacy, presented by Luke Keller. So I was streaming a short video in one of my classes recently, and it was interrupted by an ad for a product that is scientifically proven to reverse the aging process. What caught my attention was the scientifically proven part. <laughs> what does that even mean, scientifically proven? Think about a time when someone 
tried to convince you to do or believe or buy something because it was proven scientifically? How did you feel? Did you feel engaged? Did you feel disengaged, indifferent? Whether or not we like science or identify with science, our, our lives are permeated with science in the form of news, advertising, medical advice, entertainment. Our society values science. That's why scientifically proven is such a powerful statement. Our science literacy is elevated as a goal of our public education. S science literacy should empower us to engage with science in public. See if this uh, is familiar to you as a definition of science literacy. Anyone should be able to understand science by applying critical thinking to the science facts and principles that we all learned in school. Easy. There's a growing disconnect, though, between this lofty definition of science literacy and our ability to publicly engage in science. And I believe that this disconnect arises because most of the science information aimed at the general public focuses mostly on the results of science, what the scientists measured, what their conclusions were, what the possible practical applications are. In science, though, it's systematic application of the process that matters, full stop. Science is not defined by who does the study, or by what we study, or even by what we learn. Science is defined by what we do. People do science. It's an activity. So we need a new definition of science literacy that empowers us to engage with science in the general public. This new, this new definition has to engage us in a deep appreciation for science as a process, not as a subject. How do, we, how do we recognize science when we see it? What makes a study scientific? The science teacher in me is obligated to mention the scientific method. <laughs> and I bet you could each list the steps in the scientific method from memory, or could at one time. <laughs> we start with a question about nature. We develop a hypothetical answer to that question, design an experiment to test our hypothesis, analyze the results, and report our conclusions about how that hypothesis matched the experimental test. Hand in the lab report. A plus, done, right? Not quite. Just like with many areas of our education, this introduction to the scientific method is just that, an introduction an idealized summary that's easy to use in a classroom or teaching laboratory. But the scientific method is more than that list. For one thing, it leaves out one of the most crucial elements of the scientific process, communication between scientists. Science involves deep communication between multiple groups of people. It involves an often lengthy and iterative process by which scientists refine their studies. So let's focus on science as it's really practiced. And this, di this diagram, this graphic from the University of California Museum of, of Paleontology summarizes the scientific process really well. And at first, it doesn't look anything like the scientific method. By the way, I'm not telling you that the scientific method you learned in school is wrong. It's just lacking a few details. But let's take a closer look. The parts of the scientific method that we listed are front and center in these four elements of the scientific process. It's all there. Exploration and discovery involves making initial observations, asking questions, 
noticing patterns, and it can be inspired by a fancy new scientific result that puzzles us, a new technology that makes more precise measurements easier. My current favorite is the James Webb Space Telescope, or the need to solve a practical problem, or pure curiosity. Sometimes things are just wicked cool and we want to know more. Testing ideas is central to the scientific process, so it gets a big green bubble in the middle. Testing our ideas involves formulating hypotheses and then testing them through, through experiment and observation. A hypothesis is not a guess. A hypothesis is a proposed answer to the question about nature based on what we already know. And perhaps surprisingly, we don't seek to prove our hypothesis. In fact, I'll put it out there. Scientific proof is irrelevant. I say that as a committed science teacher and professional scientist. Analysis and feedback happens as a community, that communicating group. The community can be in a classroom, the scientific community, or the broad general public. Analysis and feedback involves uh, many elements, but one of the most important is the development of our trust and our confidence in science. So scientists engage in peer review and they publish in scientific journals. This is a kind of reality check, quality control, and it can able, enable us to establish the scientists themselves and their work and develop trust in the people doing the communicating and crucially, develop confidence or develop, assess our level of confidence in the message that they're communicating, in the scientific results themselves, and we don't have to understand all of the details of the result. One big part of this analysis and feedback is the generation of scientific theories. In the context of science, a theory is not a suggestion based on logic, as it often is in common speech. A scientific theory is a comprehensive explanation, an explanation of what we're studying. It's based on multiple lines of independent experimentation or observation, evidence. Obviously, science results eventually in benefits and practical outcomes. Sometimes, and, and you can think of lots of examples, we don't always know what the benefits and outcomes are when we first complete a scientific study, but one of the very important benefits and outcomes is that we can address social and cultural issues from a new perspective. And it can inform social interaction and governmental policy, and here, is where the controversy usually arises. When scientific learning enables new technology that makes our lives more comfortable or allows us to overcome health issues, we love it. When it calls our belief or our behavior into question, we're not so thrilled. It's tempting to disregard it as just a theory. A hypothesis can be just a hypothesis, since it has yet to be fully tested, but a theory can never be just a theory, because a scientific theory has been verified by a convergence of multiple lines of experimental evidence. So great diagram. I love that diagram. But what does scientific science really look like in practice? I have a couple of examples. Aside from being one of my favorite television shows, the Big Bang Theory is a comprehensive explanation and description of the origin and evolution of our universe. It's the most widely accepted scientific theory of cosmic origins by 
astronomers and physicists. But the Big Bang Theory development turned the scientific method on its head. And it exemplifies a really important part of science. The scientific process is not more technical than that original scientific method we all learned. It's not more complicated, it's more messy. And that messiness is essential, especially at the beginning of a scientific study. The Big Bang Theory started, the development of the theory as an idea, started in the early 20th century, around 1915, by a community conversation on an entirely different theory, Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Einstein and other scientists at the time suggested that the universe is infinite and static, unchanging. Then came a hypothesis, published in 1927 by Georges Lemaitre. Using Einstein's theory of relativity, he calculated that in fact, Einstein, it should be expanding. And that means that the universe was much, much smaller in the past. And you've probably heard this idea as the Big Bang. Then comes testing the ideas, right? That's what we expect. But the observations that verified Lemaitre's hypothesis were designed for a completely different study. The question was, are galaxies nearby or are they far away? Nobody knew at the time. The answer, famously established by Edwin Hubble, who now has a space telescope named after him, is that the galaxies are very far away indeed. And not only that, they're moving farther and farther away. But Hubble did not identify this as evidence for an expanding universe. Some 20 years later, George Gamow suggested that if the universe had been very, very small in the past, it would have been hot and bright, and we should still see the light from that era now, but shifted into the radio part of the spectrum. In 1963, engineers at a brand new radio telescope that was designed to look for satellites, right, Cold War, 1963, had this faint radio signal coming from all directions in space. But they hadn't heard of Gamow's hypothesis, so they didn't understand their data as evidence for the Big Bang Theory. It wasn't until the 1970s that scientists finally put all of these pieces of evidence together and formulated the Big Bang Theory, a single, self-consistent theory of our cosmic origins. This exemplifies that messiness I was talking about that's essential to the scientific process. And scientific, our science literacy should embrace, needs to embrace that messiness from kindergarten forward. Okay, one more example, much shorter, and much closer to home. The COVID-19 pandemic exemplifies the relationship between science and technology and social interaction. All of us experienced the messiness at the beginning of the pandemic. We had questions. You know the questions. Should I be wiping down my groceries? How is the virus transmitted? Should we all be wearing masks? When will the vaccine be available? Will herd immunity work? Society turned to scientists with these life or death questions, and scientists responded as they always do at the beginning of an investigation, with recommendations based on what we already know about coronaviruses and a warning. This is a new virus, so we can't be 100% sure. Not the objective certainty that we wanted, we were scared. So discussion quickly turned in the news and on social media to, who do we trust? If scientists don't know the answers, who does? Science and the scientific process couldn't move fast enough to keep up with the news cycle and social media. We lost faith in the process of science because we didn't understand the process of science. And that caused many to lose faith, faith in science itself. Science information and misinformation moves between our devices at the speed of light. So we need a new science literacy, that deep appreciation I talked about earlier 
for the process of science as it is actually practiced by scientists. This will enable us to assess science information and appreciate the work of scientists, even when the results that they report require us to reevaluate our own perspectives and understanding. And what could be more empowering than that? Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Keller. Next up, we have Dominic Catone, who is an industrial and organizational psychologist from Buffalo, New York. He graduated from Ithaca College in 1999 with a bachelor's in psychology and in 2000 with a master's in organizational communications. He advises CEOs in fortune organizations, family businesses, private equity, and across all types of industries on issues of talent strategy, culture, and team effectiveness. Now presenting How to Unsuccess Yourself, Identity Work in the Age of Workism, here is Dominic Catone. So let me just introduce you, if you don't know this man, for all my Star Wars fans, um, this is Admiral Akbar, and he was a leader in the rebellion in the earlier trilogy on Star Wars. And they were confronted in a really sticky situation where the Empire was actually going to be attacking the rebellion. And he didn't see it coming. And so he has this famous meme, right, that's across the internet all over the place. It's a trap, right? I actually want to use that as a frame of reference for sometimes why the way that we think or view success in our lives could potentially be a trap. But before we get here, I want to introduce you to this gentleman here. This most amazing human being was my father. I grew up in a family of Italian immigrants and learned quite quickly the meaning of work ethic. I started working when I was 11 years old, and it's been a quite a character-building experience for me, let me tell you, okay? Work for a lot of us is a blessing and a curse, okay? But at the same time, think of it this way. You are in the dead of a Buffalo, New York winter. You're delivering newspapers, okay? It's freezing outside. You have a hot-blooded Italian who's chasing you, right, while you're delivering your newspapers, saying, don't just throw them on the porch. <laughs> yeah, not fun. <laughs> but my conversations with my father about work were always mixed in with a little bit around success. My father never graduated from high school. My father also was a laborer for most of his life. He worked so hard throughout his years. And I don't think that he ever thought of himself as a success. To him, leadership or individuals who were successful were individuals who sat behind desks and wore ties and actually told people what to do and made a lot of money. At least that was the dream sometimes for when he was working in, in concrete, right, in ditches. How many of you, however, though, know exactly that you want to have a successful life? I, I want to have a successful life, right? How many of you know exactly what that is for you? If you do, awesome. <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. But as an only child, I was also kind of like the last great hope for my parents. And so the stakes were pretty high. I knew through my upbringing that I needed to go and get a really good education here. And I also knew that I needed to work for a big brand name organization as well. And then at the same time, I also knew I needed to work night and day to achieve this elusive version of success, which to my father was, make a lot of money so that you don't have to work like me in a mud pit. Ultimately, he just wanted better for me than what he had for himself. Success. <laughs> this, is the, this is what we all want to look like every day we wake up, right? <laughs> but is that realistic, right? I have been working with a number of individuals for the last 25 years in organizational learning, 
leadership development, and I can tell you right now, there is one thing that comes to mind for me when I talk to a number of different individuals across many different industries I partner with. We have a cultural obsession with achievement. We want to look like this. Every day, all the time. We want to have meaning and purpose in everything that we do. Right? But sometimes it's also to our detriment. It's to the detriment of our relationships. It's to the detriment of our health. It's sometimes to the detriment of our integrity. I've met a lot of really wonderful people along the way. But at the same time, I've also met a lot of individuals who, because of that need for achievement or that desire for success, are kind of like the go, 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 early onset cancer, heart attacks, strokes, depression, anxiety, loneliness. We all share in this in one way, shape, or form. But sometimes those pressures of success and the work that it takes to get there, what happens is we invest so much time in our work identity at the expense sometimes of the other identities that make up our lives. So I wanted to ask myself throughout these many years, how do we unsuccess proof ourselves, right? How do we think about success a little bit differently and still enjoy our work and still enjoy the things that we want to achieve or to do in our lives? Well, first up, go to Amazon, go to a physical bookseller, please support your local booksellers wherever they are, okay? But you'll actually see that there's countless, countless books out there around professing the promise of success. In fact, the industry is about 10 to $40 billion worth right now, and we're anticipating it to be over $100 billion in 2030. That's a lot of buying and selling success. So it's clear, all of us want it, some of us know exactly what that is, but we're trying to figure it out to a certain degree. What does success mean to you, though? It means many different things to many people. Sometimes it means a large family. It could be a big house. It could be a really great job with a really great organization. Compensation, right? It could be climbing tall mountains, or it could be training dolphins and whales. We all have different viewpoints of what success is. But the watch out or the risk right now is that we are making our success and our work that it takes to get there our primary identity. We are tying a lot of our value and our worth to essentially what we're trying to achieve, this elusive success to a certain degree. Have you ever gone on social media before and you're scrolling and you're scrolling and someone's really kind of like they're just achieving their meaning and purpose and you're like, wow, man, they're super successful. Like, man, what about me? Like, what am I doing? We do these comparisons all the time, whether it's virtual or live in the world. And I've been really thinking to myself, well, how do we actually, how do we get away from that a little bit? So I'm going to make a bold statement. I think our pursuit of success, I think sometimes the constant need for achievement in our lives is killing us. If you see the nutrition facts here, it's high in calories, trans fats, and sodium, all right? It is the bag that we keep taking out, and we gobble it all up, and we get some more, and we, we achieve, 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 achieve. Next thing you know, you want to eat all the bags. And we put it away, and we're like, no, I'm never going to do that again. And then ultimately, we just keep devouring it. But what happens, what we're not paying attention to sometimes, is that it's also devouring some of our other identities. Workism, a concept that was brought up by Derek Thompson in The Atlantic, let me define this for you quickly, is the concept that indeed, yes, work is actually essential to economic production. But what is happening is that work has now become the centerpiece of our lives. We've invested so much into our work identity and that actually the promise of any kind of, any, the promise of human welfare is also ultimately contingent upon more and more work. So the question that I have is, the pace of change has sped up the pace of urgency. And so over the last 30 years, right, we've seen terrorism, we've seen recession, we've seen pandemic. 
So my question is, is more and more work what we need to overcome some of these things? Or is a different frame of mindset about success necessary? So we live in a sensei culture, which is essentially we are pursuing or regularly pursuing pleasure because we want to further and further avoid pain. However, oftentimes our views of success are also generationally anchored. So earlier generations, success essentially meant really kind of investing the time and the effort into something, right? A lot of it was about ownership and responsibility and reputational identity that came along with that. Also the way that we actually invest our time to achieve certain things like status or even material affluence, right? I think there's been an emphasis there for a long time around who's got a bigger house, who's got a nicer car, who's got a better education, who's got luxury travel, and we do these comparisons all the time, right? Now, I'm not saying that material affluence is bad because I engage in it, <laughs> okay? I love driving around in my little red Corvette, all right? Prince would be proud of me right now, all right? But I'm also proud in driving this because this was my father's and because this was a demonstration for him of what success meant to him. It was an ability to showcase all of the work and the toil in concrete to be able to demonstrate that, look, I've got something that actually demonstrates my success. To more recent generations, right, we're actually seeing a shift around what that means. Prioritizing or maximizing time to be able to really kind of make other things in your life happen, right? It might be a little bit more focused on relational or a little bit more around kind of the meaning or purpose or kind of collective emphasis. Time affluence is essentially becoming this new luxury, this new opportunity. And the way that we flex our time enables us to be better to a certain degree. And so I have to ask myself sometimes, whether you are a world-destroying autocrat or you are a greedy, entitled brat, we have one thing at play over here. There's a lot of generational warfare happening over what success means. And ultimately, my question was, why do we continue to hurt ourselves and each other so much for success to achieve the next thing over and over again? Why do we continue to judge each generation for what they value as it relates to success? Before we get there, interesting study by Clement Ballet, Jean-Emmanuel Deneuve, and George Ward, where they actually took a functional group within a telecom and assessed essentially a number of different factors. But some of the outcomes associated with these factors included that the combination of having general happiness in the role that you're in combined with shared amount of time, right? So everyone's really kind of working the same amount of time around that. They, productivity in that organization increased 13%. And at the same time, what they also found was that at the bottom of that, the bottom motivator was compensation. So was my dad maybe wrong that if I really kind of make more and more money over life, I'm gonna be much more successful and happy along the way? Perhaps, right? There's a lot of studies out there that are identifying this. But I am a huge fan of the Stoics and Roman philosophers. And, you know, there are some really kind of interesting modern thinkers right now who are bringing Stoicism into the modern age like Orion Holiday, right? But Seneca is one of my absolute favorites. And so true happiness is to understand our duties towards God and man, to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future, not to amuse ourselves with either hopes or fears, but to rest satisfied with what we have, which is abundantly sufficient. So this is my argument. What is abundantly sufficient is that success in life is that you are living it. That you are here and now living. And that in of itself is success. Hard for me to think of it that way when I was a young man trying to achieve all the things before. But that is something that I think oftentimes we forget, is that what is abundantly sufficient is our life. This man learned it as well. My father passed away at 75, 
the last 10 years of his life. He spent a lot of his life talking about who did what and who made how much and who was really kind of successful over here or whatnot. But the last 10 years of his life, he gave himself the opportunity to just enjoy the fact that he was living, that that in of itself was a successful life, that that was the gift of life for my father. And for me, it completely changed my world when he passed away. It reframed the meaning of success for me. It reframed who I am as a person. I was confronted with having to ask that. And after years of working in high pressure situations and really kind of like focusing on what success meant to me and, and facing all of my fears and dealing with the grief of my father, what ended up happening to me was I was suffering from panic, anxiety, agoraphobia, and I recognized that my viewpoints on my life needed to reframe a little bit in order for me to find what true success meant to me. And so I had to ask myself who I am, which is the question that I'm going to ask you. Who are you? If I were to ask you that question, how would you, how would you engage? How, what would you say? Most adults, the first place that we go to is what we do for a living. In fact, Gallup, which is a national research and consulting firm, at the end of 89, they've been doing this study, and what they found is that over 50% of adults most closely identify with their work. And seven out of 10 students most closely identify with their choice of study. Have you ever introduced yourself to somebody? Hi, I'm Dominic. Hi, Matt. Nice to meet you. What do you do for a living? Oh, hi, I'm Dominic. Hi, Matt. It's nice to meet you. What, what do you study? It's always at the forefront. And one of the perils that we have right now in the age of workism is identified by Al Ginny, who's a business ethics professor at Loyola University of Chicago, is that the more and more we focus on our work identity, and then when that work is taken away from us, the greater likelihood of us falling apart. So as I asked this question around, what do I need to do? I thought to myself, I need to continue to undo some of my thinking around what that means to me. So that's exactly what I've done for myself and what I try to help coach other people who really feel like they've invested so much in their work identity and they want to focus on some other identities as well to help balance it out for themselves. The first piece to around understanding, right? Just recognizing that your work identity trumps everything else. That is where you invest most of your time, Sometimes your achievement, achievement after achievement after achievement is not enough anymore. And you have to ask yourself, how is this impacting other areas of my life? So this is really kind of confronting it for yourself. The second piece is around narrating. You know, maybe instead of talking about, well, this is what I do for a living, or essentially this is what I study, or these are all the things that I've won along my lifetime, it's how can you share experiences that you've had with other people? How are you framing yourself with the rest of the world? The characteristics that make you a human being, right? Going back to that concept of success, just simply living and being with other people. Divert was the hardest one for me, was identifying activities in my life that had no goal or judge or shame added to it. It was simply for my own enjoyment. It was because of the fact that I was actually enjoying it, I was sharing it with other people, and it was something that helped to create a diversion away from that primary kind of work identity. And the final piece is around occupy. This is the goal. This is where you start to occupy your life in exchange for that need to achieve, or that kind of that success kind of mantra that you have over and over again that plays in your head. So finally, um, this is a full circle moment for me. Over 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to speak alongside Maya Angelou. Part of my presentation was essentially how people from different backgrounds can come together around shared goals. Hers was to have the courage to compose your life. And I have had the courage to compose my life over the last 20 years. And what I would say to that young 21-year-old man is I would say, don't get so caught up in appreciation and recognition and reputation and compensation and all the sations, right? 
status, all of those things, right? Because what happens is it takes us further and further away from what all of us want to have at some point in our lives, which is peace. So remember what I said, that the success of living is enough. The other thing that I would say to that young man is to spend more time with your dad. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dominic. Our next presenter is Alyssa Davis, a marketer from Apex, North Carolina. They've built a social media platform with over 125,000 followers with their content based on strategies that empower women to feel more confident in their bodies. Here's Shame Sucks, Let's Talk, presented by Alyssa Davis. Your friends talk about you behind your back. In fact, your bad breath is making you unpopular. How did that make you feel? Where does shame settle in your body? Perhaps your shoulders began to sag. Maybe your head began to hang. Muscles weak as if the air itself is too heavy and it's all your fault. Or maybe you heard the title of this talk and you're thinking, she can't pull a fast one on me. Shame has the ability to paralyze the body and impairs our capacity to think and act clearly. It can feel like a fog or veil has settled over everything, making it difficult to function. When this happens, it's normal to revert to a sunken body posture, physical expression of wanting to disappear as feelings of isolation and powerlessness take over. It's a feeling many of us probably experience when facing a common fear. Public speaking. <laughs> If we traded places right now, your muscles might start to feel like rubber. There's a reason I opted for the flats today instead of the heels. Many advertisers are aware of this phenomenon, and some are not afraid to use it to their advantage. A popular mouthwash brand, one that you probably have sitting on your bathroom counter at home, ran a wildly successful marketing campaign that resurrected an old Latin word for bad breath in order to invent a new disease, then turn around and sell you the cure. This is what marketers refer to as the halitosis effect. Before this campaign, society didn't consider bad breath to be an embarrassment, much less a disease. Today, however, a quick internet search of the term halitosis is likely to result in a list of symptoms, treatments, and preventative measures. You know what they say, four to five doctors recommend daily shame as a part of your morning routine. This campaign exploited the fears of the consumers, societal rejection, using these shame-inducing accusations. Your friends talk about you behind your back. Your bad breath is making you unpopular. And even, no one wants to marry a pretty girl with halitosis. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with fear. If you've fallen prey to fear of shame-based marketing, you're not alone. I myself have 100% been guilty of adding yet another mascara tube to the makeup graveyard that completely covers my bathroom counter, vanity, and nightstand. But even before I had access to beauty products or the money to buy them, I already had access to the impacts of this type of messaging on my self-image. When I was a kid, probably around 12 years old, I discovered the scrub-out tool in Photoshop. <laughs> this is a feature where you can completely get rid of anything that you don't want in your photo, and for me, that thing was my raccoon eyes. I thought I had found a life hack that nobody else knew about, and it was going to be a game changer. I spent hours in Photoshop scrubbing out my dark under eye circles from every family photo. This was back when we still sent out a Christmas letter, and you better believe I made sure every photo passed through me before it ever saw the light of day for our friends and family. A few short years later, I discovered a whole new frontier with social media. New connections, new ideas, new obsessions. The targeted ads were relentless. 
This weird hack will help you burn fat overnight. 13 of the best and worst celebrity beach bodies. The targeted workout you need to get rid of hip dips. So many new problem areas I had never known before. Muffin top, bingo arms, thunder thighs. These messages flooded my feed and told me exactly what I needed to change if I expected others to look at me without disgust. According to research from Yanklovich Inc., the average person in North America sees roughly 4,000 to 10,000 ads per day. Many teen girls wake up in the morning to an alarm blaring from their phones. Before they brush their teeth, eat their first meal of the day, or even shower, their phone is in their hands, scrolling, scrolling, being influenced, inviting in a flood of stimulation and stressors into their brain space moving at the speed of shame. While still in bed, they can instantly access TikTokers sharing their waist trainer results, a YouTuber describing what they eat in a day, or an Instagram influencer posting retouched beach pictures. And let's be honest, who here hasn't lost themselves down a Twitter rabbit hole at least once in their life? <laughs> to some, this may seem trivial. After all, we as adults understand that waist trainers may shift your internal organs, that eating less than 1,000 calories per day may be a symptom of an eating disorder and that many images online are retouched, often beyond recognition. But to young, impressionable minds, these suggestions plant the seed of what they should be buying, using, wearing, or even who they should be, as opposed to what they might actually need. I thought as a kid that my scrubbed out under eyes were harmless and that it was undetectable. I just wanted to avoid being asked, are you sick? But the truth is that having a photo editing ritual made me for, feel more insecure every time I looked in the mirror and I saw the unedited version of my own face. Fear is a powerful motivator. That's why we're bombarded with fear-based marketing. Rather than selling you the product's pleasure, some brands sell you the fear of missing out. Anyone ever heard of FOMO? Last week, I was trying to buy tickets for Dear Evan Hansen and I was a bit on the fence about which ones I wanted to buy. I can be a bit indecisive at times, and this was not at all helped by the timer in the corner that was ticking down, letting me know I had exactly 15 minutes to check out or they were going to give away my tickets to someone else. Time pressure has the ability to completely change our decision-making process and affect our judgment, causing us to make risky choices. The little voice in our head shouts, it's now or never. Fear-based marketing can be influential and persuasive. Numerous psychological studies have demonstrated that people are more inspired and more driven by the fear of losing something than they are by the hope of gaining something. This principle is known as loss aversion. People want to avoid experiences that bring them any kind of pain, whether that be physical, mental, emotional, or even social. In fact, social pain such as rejection can cause responses in the brain similar to physical pain. Rejection literally hurts. Fear-driven headlines are often used on YouTube in the form of clickbait. Titles like 13 Reasons Why Your Boss Hates You Promise a Quick Fix. During the COVID-19 pandemic, information regarding food, face mask, and toilet paper shortages led to a drastic increase in demand. This demonstrates how fear motivates our buying decisions. It certainly impacted mine. I know I personally still have toilet paper in my garage that is industrial size, despite not having a dispenser capable of holding a wheel of toilet paper. <laughs> if only everything in life was as reliable as fear. Fear-based marketing can be controversial, but for many folks it comes down to one single question. Does it work? The answer is yes, fear-based marketing works at creating negative emotions. Does it work at getting us to click add to cart? There, the waters start to get a bit more murky. Let me ask you something. When you walk into a convenience store, what do you see? Signs saying smoking causes fatal lung cancer. What do people still do? Smoke. It appears that overuse of fear in marketing can result in feelings ranging from passive helplessness to outraged backlash, neither of which gets more focus put on the message's call to action. And yet, another example had the opposite impact. A Vietnamese ad campaign 
saved countless lives by depicting the gruesome results of riding a motorcycle without a helmet. This fear-based campaign was truly effective. There is nuance to the ethical consideration here. We have to ask ourselves, is there a legitimate cause for fear, or are we simply being manipulated? Speaking of manipulation, shame-based marketing encourages consumers to feel self-conscious about the ways that others perceive us. This type of advertising first creates shame, then sells a solution. Shame marketing taps into distress over perceived failures, stirs up, and even creates insecurities. Businessman Jonah Sachs calls this inadequacy marketing. For example, a beer commercial in which the bartender tells a man, when you start caring about how your beer tastes, put down your purse and I'll get you a real beer, followed by a voiceover command to man up, implying to men everywhere that if they don't drink that specific brand of beer, they are not real men. A gym ad with a picture of a barrel and the words, this is no shape for a woman. A PSA using black and white photos of real kids and a bright red slogan. Warning, fat prevention begins in the buffet line. Shame, it's what's for dinner. Studies indicate that the brains of our youth are vulnerable, dynamic, and highly responsive to feedback. Children yearn to fit in with their peers, to belong. These advertisements send the message that who you are is wrong and bad and must be corrected in order for you to be accepted. The narrative is, how horrible would it be to be Madison or Sarah or Aiden or even yourself? These tactics are condescending, othering, and a desperate play at superiority at the expense of others. There is one factor that makes shame-based marketing much more dangerous than any other type. Shame never has to be put to the test. You see, fear-based fear marketing works when the threat of harm seems real. Shame, on the other hand, has little to prove. A mere suggestion is enough to make your stomach twinge with anxiety, similar to that feeling in the pit of your stomach following a breakup. Shame can rely on the implication that your wife would never say this to you directly, but she'd be more than happy to gossip about it behind your back. The advertisement that you see saying the words, muffin tops are only good in the bakery, will never have to prove its implied message that fat bodies are unlovable. They just have to make you feel unlovable. But this goes beyond mere discomfort. As Brene Brown once said, shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of change. Studies indicate that those who battle alcoholism are more likely to relapse if they feel ashamed. This applies to other problematic behaviors as well. Those who live with shame are more likely to resort to unhealthy coping mechanisms because they feel that they are worthless. Shame locks us into our harmful patterns by telling us that healing is not possible. Because of this, marketing that shames the consumer is unlikely to result in truly changed behavior. Now, you may be asking yourself, that's all well and good, but why would a company whose goal is to make money care about the fallout of shame-based marketing? Isn't it all about the bottom line? But the truth is there is so much more to selling than just increased revenue. There's also brand reputation, emotive association, customer referrals, and buyer trust. Consumers of today are unique. The digital age is changing the way that we research and select products. Picture the last shopping trip you made. Chances are you probably saw some of your fellow shoppers on their phones. Maybe they were tweeting or wishing their mom a happy birthday, but some were likely looking up product reviews and competitor pricing. It is no longer enough to simply say, our product is the best. You have to back it up. Studies indicate that before making an in-store purchase, over 80% of smartphone users will conduct internet research on their devices. Recent shifts in marketing have demonstrated that managing a successful business is no longer about making a sale at any cost. It's about customer experience. Many brands make promises that go beyond product functionality and instead reflect a facet of their target audience's identities. A great example of this is the Dove Real Beauty campaign. They have effectively moved beyond just a method of cleansing your body and instead remind us all that all bodies are worthy. As Maya Angelou once said, people will forget what you said, 
People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Studies indicate that empowering marketing tactics equip consumers with the options, tools, and resources they need to make a more informed decision, resulting in more loyal customers who come back to purchase again and again. Empowering marketing helps customers feel satisfied with the brand experience, motivated to interact positively with the company, and excited to become brand evangelists. Shame marketing paints the consumer as the villain in their own stories. We are the ones messing things up, dropping the ball, and embarrassing ourselves. Empowering marketing, on the other hand, paints us as the hero in our own stories, with the power to enact change on our own, with a product or service coming alongside us to help. Parents, it's important to note who is most affected by this type of marketing and who is most vulnerable. Teens. But you have an opportunity here. Open up conversations with your kids. The next time you see a fear-based slogan, don't be afraid to share how it makes you feel. The next time you hear a shame-based marketing campaign, don't be afraid to say, ugh, that made me feel a little yucky. And be prepared to answer why if your kid asks you, really, what's that about? When you purchase based on positively marketed products, share that as well. You know the impact of fear and shame-based marketing. Now you have the power to move forward consuming with intention. Your voice matters. You have the power to vote with your dollar. And if you're not sure if that's really true, Consider the recent case of a very famous lingerie company who abandoned a long-standing practice of relying on unrealistic beauty standards and who now showcases real-life female role models. Why? Pressure from the public. I guess the secret's out. Your voice really does matter. And if you're somebody who has internalized the message that you are not enough, know this. You are not alone. And it is never too late to push back and say no, I refuse to believe that. The version of me who struggled so much with her dark under eye circles never knew the freedom that comes from embracing herself, imperfections and all. And it wasn't until I gave myself permission to start taking up space unapologetically that I started to understand that those flaws don't define me. That little girl who edited every single family photo would never have guessed that today I would be signed as a model. Let me ask you two questions. Who was the first person who told you you are not enough? And second, what if they were wrong? Thank you so much, Alyssa. Coming to the stage next is Yvette Sturbank from Corning, New York. Yvette is an associate professor at IC, her research focuses on corporate activism, how effective corporate activism can empower marginalized groups, and how lip service with no action can cause harm to society. But she can tell you better than I can. Here is Silence Has No Place, presented by Yvette Sturbank. So in 2016, the state of North Carolina passed a bill. It was called the Public Facilities Privacy and Security Act. You may have also heard it called the bathroom bill. Sounds like a great idea, right? Who doesn't want privacy and security when they're using the bathroom? However, behind this seemingly innocent title held some pretty dangerous legislation. The legislation said that uh, anyone uh, using the bathrooms in a public building, so government buildings, school buildings, college, state college buildings, had to use the bathroom that matched their gender identity on their birth certificate, regardless of their current gender identity. And there were 16 other states considering a similar bill that year. But North Carolina was the only state to pass that bill and a year later, they repealed the bill. Why? Because of corporations. Corporations pushed back hard. PayPal uh, took away a facility that they were going to build in the state that would have brought in billions of dollars of income. 
uh, organizations like the NCAA, the NBA, and other major concert promoters canceled events that would have brought in a lot of people. And companies from Adidas to a number of investment banks to Airbnb pushed at the state to repeal this legislation, threatening to pull their business from the state. And it worked. It worked. The, uh, the legislation was repealed. This is called corporate sociopolitical activism. It's an area that I study. Um, corporate sociopolitical activism is when companies get involved in or take a stand on an issue uh, that is maybe a little bit out of the realm of what their, their product focus is. And we see this increasing. We see this activity increasing, partly because what the data shows us, like this a slide here from uh, Edelman, which is a large communications firm that studies the idea of trust, is that trust in the government is at an all-time low. In fact, people trust businesses more than they trust government. And the same kinds of studies show us that people look to businesses to solve, to address some of these social issues that they don't trust government to address. And the data shows us that we want companies to do this, and we hold companies accountable for this. So corporate sociopolitical activism can take the many forms. Um, You've seen these, uh, these examples. You've probably seen advertisements that promote a feminist message. You've probably seen uh, posts on social media that support movements like Black Lives Matter. You've probably heard CEOs talk about issues like immigration rights or refugee rights, uh, and more recently, companies taking on um, uh, issues like uh, uh, women's reproductive health. And this kind of activism has been increasing since, uh, for really in the last decade and since 2016 particularly, um, because uh, we're asking companies to take these stances. And when they don't take stances or when companies stay silent, we call them out on it. We want them to be more vocal. So unless you've been hiding under a rock, you're probably very aware that last year, Florida passed a bill um, it was called the Parental Rights and Education Bill, also a very innocent sounding name. You're probably more familiar with the term don't say gay bill, um, which says that teachers in public schools at certain levels cannot talk about issues of sexual orientation or gender identity. And unless again you've been living under a rock, you're probably very aware that Disney is a very large entity in the state of Florida. It brings in billions of dollars of revenue to the state of Florida. And Disney itself is, of course, a very powerful company. And so this was a moment when Disney could have stood up and really pushed back against this legislation. legislation. Disney's initial response was pretty lackluster. They tried to sort of fly under the radar. Um, they, they released an internal memo that said, we do support our LGBTQ uh, employees, but we're not going to make a public statement because, because corporate statements are divisive. They can be weaponized. And people pushed back. Customers pushed back. Employees pushed back. Even the descendants of Walt Disney himself, the founder of the company, pushed back. And Disney had to take a stronger stand. Now, Disney could probably be doing more, and, and this kind of uh, a push at Disney may, may push them in that direction. But what these examples show us is that, first of all, in the case of North Carolina, companies have power. Companies have power to affect social change. In this case, in similar cases, we can see that customers, employer, employees, and investors have power to encourage companies to push companies to address these social issues. So at this point, uh, a question that often comes up for me, uh, I teach this in, in classroom situations, and a question that often comes up is whether this is a good thing for society that we are so reliant on companies to do this kind of work for us. And I think that is a really good question, one that you should be asking, that we should all be asking. That's another TED Talk, and it could fill an entire other TED Talk. I study corporate activism, and I study what companies do uh, to support some of the messages that they put out. 
And so what I want to focus on is the fact that we are at this place where we are reliant on companies, we are pushing companies to take these social stances, so how can we ensure that companies, do, uh, companies are doing it responsibly and effectively? How can we use our power to ensure that? So I'll, I'll give you some example from a, a previous study that I did. Um, and to give you uh, some context for the study, uh, we'll go back to uh, 2004 with the Campaign for Real Beauty, um, as mentioned previously, done by Dove. Um, and this was a moment in time, probably the first moment in time, where uh, a company had really addressed this issue of body image, women's body image in advertising and reposition it in a really positive way. And it was really successful for Doug. And other companies saw this and they began to think about their own uh, messages and their own advertisements. How were they portraying women? How could they support women? Beneficial for the company. And then of course, we had the Me Too movement. And the Me Too movement raised the sort of dialogue around women's uh, issues in the workplace uh, and uh, women's rights issues as well. And so we began to see advertisers creating what we call fembertisements. And so you have seen these ads. These are ads that promote positive messages about women. Uh, it can be about body issue. It can be about gender equity in the workplace. It can be about the judgment, that judgment calls that we make around women. And this became so ubiquitous. There's so many fembertisements out there that the advertising industry began to create awards for fembertisements. And so a group of researchers and I were really interested uh, in fembertisements and really understanding what else were companies doing? These companies that were winning these very prestigious awards, what else were they doing to support women? Were they just putting out these messages or were they doing more? And so, uh, we spent a winter watching these advertisements. It's a great way to spend a long Ithaca winter. And these are really good advertisements. These are advertisements that any Ithaca College Park School student should be proud to go out and make, right? These are advertisements that made us feel really proud to identify as women. They made us laugh. They made us cry. They really uh, garnered, garnered emotion. And in fact, the data shows us that women, a majority of women, say they will make a purchase from companies who create these advertisements, that, that they, they feel that that empowers them. And in fact, a majority of women also say that they believe that femvertisements dismantle gender barriers. So what did we find when we studied these award-winning companies? Unfortunately, the results were not half as inspiring as these ads themselves. So I'll give you just a few highlights. Um, first of all, we did find that companies that won awards for femvertisements weren't doing a whole lot more than companies that had not won award for femvertisements in terms of uh, uh, pulling women up inside of the company, supporting women inside of companies, and also external work. Wasn't, doesn't mean they weren't doing anything, but they just weren't doing anything more. So they made great advertisements, but they weren't doing much more. We also probably not a surprise to many of you, found that the board of directors for most of these award-winning companies were heavily male. Um, very few had even 50% of women on the board. I think there were two. Uh, and there were three of the companies that actually had 50% 50, 50 of women in leadership positions. So women weren't in these decision-making positions within these companies that were putting out ads that had messages of equity. Uh, in, in equity for women. So it became really clear to us that it is important that we uh, think about how companies, not only what companies are saying, but how they're backing up what they're saying. And so how do we do that? We have power. We have power uh, as customers to, to spend our dollars wisely, to think about the companies that we're buying from, the products that we're buying. And if we see that a companies are not actually doing the work or aligning with our values, we can spend our dollars elsewhere. Companies exist to make money. So we have that power as consumers. We also have empower, power as employees. Um, so in the past 20 years, we have seen an increase in corporate support of LGBTQ rights. Uh, and, uh, and it has increased year over year. This is a phenomenon, actually, that a number of researchers study 
because it's been such a, a level of progress uh, in terms of you know, companies 20 years ago, ago would not address anything related to the LGBTQ community, and now they're sort of like, like fighting each other for the opportunity to sponsor different events, et cetera. So where did that change come from? The researchers who study this track it to the employees inside the companies. It was employees inside the companies who said, we need better benefits for same-sex marriage. We need to better showcase the LGBTQ plus community in our marketing materials. And those actions were taken and companies became uh, pushed to, uh, to address these issues. So employees have power. And finally, if you have money to invest in companies, you have the opportunity to ask for data. You have the opportunity to push companies to tell you what they're really doing, not just what they're saying. And we see more and more investors who are asking for very specific data on environmental, social, and govern governance uh, support within the companies. And when we ask for this kind of data, we force companies to be more transparent, and we may even force them to be even more proactive uh, in what they're doing. So clearly, uh, as, uh, as I referenced the femvertising research, we spent months on that research. As consumers, we don't have months to spend to figure out what companies are doing. So how can we realistically understand what companies are actually doing in support of the words they're saying? This is an example I share with you from the summer of 2020. Um, you will recall very clearly, I'm sure, the summer of 2020, a lot of people took to the streets in protest after the murder of George Floyd. And, uh, and many, many companies began to post on social media their support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And so a group of people, not academic researchers, just really thoughtful people, took it upon themselves to create a shared Google Doc that anybody could contribute to. And so the universe went onto the internet and they filled out this data. And they looked at companies, they, they uh, listed companies um, that were, uh, were supporting Black Lives Matter in, on their social media feeds uh, and on their websites. And, and then they listed what the companies were actually doing in support of those words, or not doing in support of those words. So a simple spreadsheet. And that data is easily found. This is all from companies' websites, from companies' uh, reports that they put out in terms of their corporate social responsibility. That data is easily found, so it's easy, easy for us to find that data. So we have the power to do that. We also have the power of social influence. I'm sure all of you are on social media in one form or another. Um, this is an example, again, from the summer of 2020. There was a founder of a, a makeup company for black women who saw, again, these companies posting uh, a commitment to racial equity within their companies, and she created a hashtag in an Instagram campaign called pull up or shut up, which means pull the people who are in marginalized communities up in your companies or stop saying that you support these rights. And she challenged these companies to show what they were actually doing, and companies responded. And this is an ongoing campaign. You can look up her website. Pull up or shut up. So we have these, uh, these opportunities to, to really challenge what companies are doing. And this is important because when companies put out messages and they don't back that message up, with real action, they're not addressing the systemic issues behind all of these issues. And, and we, as consumers, we see these messages, we think, oh, here's a company that we trust, right? We trust companies more than we trust the government. And they, they see us, they see the issue, they're addressing the issue, when in fact the systems behind that issue are not being addressed, so we're lulled into this sense of complacency complacency. So it's really, really important that we push companies to do more than just say something. And I know companies are powerful. Corporations are super powerful. I know that I can tweet something. I don't have a lot of followers on Twitter. Um, I know that I can decide not to buy a product, and it's not going to bring a company to their knees. It's not going to make my individual actions, not going to make them change. But what we do see is that collective action, movements, 
We are capable of making companies think about their systems, how they're addressing uh, pay equity inside of their organizations, who they're supporting um, in communities, right? We can ask those questions and we can push companies to provide those answers. We have that power to do that. So I hope that you will find your own power as a consumer, as an employee, as an investor, and push these companies to back these words up with action. Thank you. Thank you, Yvette. Closing out the first half of the day is another Ithaca College professor, Elizabeth Bleicher, the former director of the exploratory program for students who come to college uh, to discover their major. She is a professor of English and currently serves as Dean of Student Success and Retention at Ithaca College. Please enjoy Why Are We Here? Rethinking the Purpose of College, presented by Elizabeth Bleicher. Good morning. I always kick off my first year seminar for incoming college students with what seems like a simple question. How many of you have ever been asked why you're going to college? Invariably, only about two raise their hands. I see people nodding today. And those two who raise their hands are almost always first generation, the first in their family to attend college. When I ask the other students, why do you think you've never been asked? You can guess the answer. It's usually, it was just expected, or I need it to get a good job. Based on the assumption that it's harder to do something if you don't know why you're doing it, I'm here today to meddle and to help perhaps young people who are struggling with making a bad decision, worried, to help you make more informed decisions. If you can learn a bit today about how history and economic events may apply to you and have an impact on you. And my goal is to get you to think about your goals, to establish which are authentically yours and which maybe are not yours and you need to rethink them. I'm also here to challenge the assumptions that reduce college to a transaction in professional credentialing. Now, the idea of treating education like uh, a socioeconomic class marker is not new. In 19th century England, formal education was reserved, was reserved for the sons of the wealthy, the aristocracy, but it had absolutely nothing to do with how they got wealthy. In that time in history, wealth was conveyed along with your social rank through real estate. This is what made you a gentleman, okay? But that was disrupted by the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution made it possible for the first time in history to make money. Up until now, there had just been an aristocracy and everybody else. But with the Industrial Revolution, we saw the rise of a middle class, people who created a new class by manufacturing and selling consumer goods. Manufacture requires workers. So people migrated from rural areas to work in those factories, no longer for aristocratic masters or just their sustenance, but also for wages. And just as they had on farms, their children came to work with them alongside them in the factories to generate family income. Now, this is the first of a series of hard truths I'm gonna be sharing. The ethical argument that child labor laws were put into place to protect children masks larger economic factors that were really driving those laws. Because what those laws were really intended to do was to pull children out of the workforce and send them to school in order to drive down the labor force and drive up wages for adults and create a generation of workers who had enough basic numeracy and literacy to be profitable. Now, with everybody now a consumer, you would think the middle class would be thrilled, right? But the, the aristocracy was still snubbing them. They referred to the middle class as new money, which meant your wealth was earned, it wasn't inherited. And to add injury to that insult, you couldn't vote if you didn't own land. 
and the aristocracy owned all the land. So, to bring themselves closer to their goals, and really, I have to tell you that not being able to shape government, not being able to vote, meant that they couldn't control things for their interests, and that really burned their crumpets. And so, so the middle class thought, you know what, what's the aristocracy done for us lately? They're, you know, we, we actually work for a living. We make more things, we make more money, there are more of us, we want more. So the middle class bought their sons access to formal education so that they could network with the elite, which helped them as they bought or married their way into the real estate that would get them the vote. And once they had that, they could raise themselves economically and socially. That just left that pesky new money insult. So the middle class did something brilliant. They redefined the definition of the word gentleman. When we, the way we use the word gentleman is testament to how successful they were. When we say someone is a gentleman, we're not calling someone a landowner. We are calling them someone who treats people well, someone who has manners, someone who's educated. Collateral effect, when we say someone has class, we're not calling them rich nobility. We're saying that they behave like a superior person. Now the middle class's workers saw all of this and they thought, huh, knowledge is power. So they formed working men's clubs, not for socializing, but to educate themselves. And I want you to pay attention to what their dues paid for. Their dues paid for access to other members, to learning spaces, to materials, to knowledgeable guides, and to experiences. The very same things we pay for when we go to college. Workers called this movement self-help. It was now understood that education was the key to social mobility. Because if, you're, if a gentleman, if being called a gentleman was based on your conduct and your character, that meant that it was a social status to which anyone could aspire and with effort anyone could achieve. It was no longer based on an economic accident of your birth. I want for you to think about this. They took, in that moment, they took new money and this movement, the, the working class and middle class banded together and this movement gave rise to a new term that we still use to this day as a term of respect. And that is self-made man. They took new money and turned it and said, self-made man, everything you have, you earned. That's power. Now I want for you to jump from the 19th to the 20th century. When the men went off to World War II, women stepped up and kept the country functional. But when the men came home, the government needed those women out of the workforce. Sound familiar? They needed those women out of the workforce, and so they told them that home and hearth is what the boys fought for. That's where you belong. But that wasn't going to be enough. They still had a lot of people to absorb. So they gave returning soldiers a beautiful thank you for your service. You survived the war. We're going to send you to college to keep you out of the workforce until this glut is over. Men who had, up to that point, neither money nor incentive for college suddenly had both. I want for us to think about, and most of us know that blue collar means manual labor, but I want for us to think deeply about that metaphor. The collar is the yoke on a more evolved beast of burden. A blue collar hides the dirt and the sweat of manual labor. That's why it's used for uniforms. A white collar implies easier labor. It means you don't have to work with your hands. But it also means I can afford to replace an easily spoiled consumer good. Now, if your family, if your people were factory workers, farmers, if you were lucky enough to, say, own a butcher shop, and you suddenly had access 
to college to become white collar, that would feel like winning the lottery, instant access to class mobility. This is where you come in, think about it. The rich always had an inheritance to pass down. But in that moment, working class and middle class men got a legacy that they could pass down. I got to go to college, so you should go to college. So you must go to college. It was just expected. It's easy to understand, four generations, right? Now, I want for you to take a minute and reflect and think about for yourself, how did I get here? How did I get to college or, or the expectation that I will go? And if you're sitting here, if you are a woman, if you are a person of color, if you are an immigrant, if you are coming out of a high school where the expectation is not that you will go to college, but that you might not even graduate, don't give yourself a pat on the back for being here. Give yourself a parade. And if you think that all of this history doesn't apply to you, I beg you, please look up the history of redlining, which was outlawed in 1968 and think how you may have been impacted by the fact that larger economic forces and our own US government deprived people of color and devalued real estate, the single most common means of transmitting wealth between generations. These headlines behind me are, 19, are 2021. That was then, this is now, I don't think so. So in doing this, I'm asking for you to think about how you approach college. I'm challenging you to change how you think about the purpose of college. Because if you approach college as only a means to a job, you are positioning yourself to serve larger economic forces, not to shape them. I'm asking for you to change how you think about why you are here. There's one more historic event that I want to talk about because it's, it's not just ancient history that's shaping your future. And this is hard to talk about. But the death of over a million people in the pandemic taught us two brutal lessons that affect your future. One of them is that it has redefined our relationship to work because it has made us experience painfully and personally just how finite our time and our lives really are. And the second is that it has also created a current and projected workforce in which you will not want for work. And you're gonna have more control over your work than the generation before you. So with that in mind, I want you to be absolutely clear about something. Work, it's unreasonable to think that work will make us happy, that all of our work is gonna make us happy. It is completely reasonable, though, to use education to identify the components for building a life in which the majority of our work is meaningful. That's how I want for you to start thinking about you. I want for you to study you. I want for you to pay attention. What are the things that you're doing when you lose track of time? That's valuable data when you're trying to figure out what your interests are and what you could be studying and what your work could be and what your pleasures could be. It's also the case that developing your values makes it easier for you to make decisions and to move in the direction that you want to go. Those are the things that I'm challenging you to do today. And I want to be blisteringly clear. You have a choice. For the first time since World War II, you can legitimately question whether you have to go to college to be or become middle class. But if you're gonna go, it's a choice, and you need to treat it like a choice and commit. Social scientists tell us that you are gonna have over 20 jobs in your lifetime. Some of them will become obsolete in your lifetime, and some of them haven't been invented yet. So investing four years of your intellect and your heart and your money and your time in college needs to pay off in way more than a job. 
Now I'm challenging you to think about college, not as buying a degree, because you are not buying a degree. What you are buying is access. Like the Victorian middle class, you're buying access to other members to grow your network. Like the Victorian working class, you're buying access to other members so you don't have to go it alone. You are buying access to spaces and to materials and to knowledgeable guides and to experiences that have been curated for you by people like me. But access is not achievement. Hence, exercise, bicycles, and gym memberships. Achievement is predicated on what you do with your access. James Clear argues that every action you take is a vote for the type of person you want to become. I am trying to challenge you today to vote with intention. And if you run your learning practice by not turning in work, skipping class, trying to get a passing grade without turning in the work or by learning the material, or paradoxically, if you run your learning practice by only chasing grades and external validation, then in that moment, if every action you take is a vote for who you want to become, you're voting to become less. A wise man changed my life. Paul Hansom said, I have a creative intelligence for which I am responsible. <laughs> he was so wise, I married him. <laughs> what that means is that if I have a creative intelligence for which I'm responsible, it is incumbent on me to define for myself what success is, and then to pursue that success by growing my creative intelligence, which is the engine that powers all the other things. I am responsible. Since I've been teaching young adults and adolescents since the late Cretaceous period, growing that engine is my go-to answer for why are we here. And I got it from an old dead white guy, Cardinal John Henry Newman, who said, the purpose of college is to cultivate the integrative habit of mind. Newman said, not to know the relative disposition of things is the condition of slaves and children. 21st century translation, if you don't know how things relate to each other, if you can't make connections between ideas and causes and effects, you are dependent you are manipulable. You are not free. Liberal education at its root, liber, means free. Liberal education is literally the education required to be and remain a free person. That's why it was, that's because education is liberating, right? That's why it was illegal to teach enslaved people how to read. Education is liberating, right? Now. I have spoken with students who say, I'm struggling. I really don't like this. I'm not good at it. When am I ever going to use this? It doesn't matter. Hear me. There is no wasted experience. There is no wasted knowledge. The, the, the act of struggle, of learning something when it's hard for you, of learning something that you're not naturally inclined to do, is a skill and it is empowering. And it, it makes you a more authentic leader, and it also empowers you. If you can learn when you don't want to, you can learn when it's to your advantage, or you can learn when you really need to. In all of this, you may have noticed, I am not challenging you to find your passion. Because here's the last hard truth. Passion is frequently revealed by commitment and curiosity, not just motivating it. Persistent, committed curiosity applied to yourself and to your world and to the people around you who look like they're finding their work meaningful, that's gonna reveal your path to you and power you while you're on it. 
And I urge you not to be afraid of the anxiety of not knowing where that path is taking you. It's okay if you can sit with that anxiety and you can apply that curiosity to yourself and you can grow your engine, you, your path will reveal itself and you will power yourself on it. Stay curious, grow your engine, even when it feels like you don't know where you're going. Trust the process. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming back. Starting off the... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Starting of the second session is John Gustaferro. John is a brand strategist, nonprofit executive, and magician from Anaheim, California. In this enthralling talk today, John will be talking to us about our ability to create magic and might ask for some help from the audience with some of his captivating magic tricks. Presenting Wonder is One Degree Away. How did you do that? Where did it go? Can you make a million dollars up here? These are just some of the questions I get asked when people find out that I'm a pro professional magician. Now, I don't have a million dollars, but I thought I'd start with a little bit of money, 51 cents to be exact. I'm in this little Ziploc bag. You can clearly see both sides. One coin that's worth more, it's a 50 cent piece. Then we have another one that's worth more and got good luck and fortune. So if I was to ask you what coin you would like, the half dollar or penny, what would you say? The half dollar going for the monetary value, I see. So we'll do something magical with the half dollar. Don't take your eyes off. It's going to melt right through the bag. Check this out. Just leaving the penny trapped inside. Now, you probably think there's a hole. Who would have said the penny, by the way? You would have said the Here's a penny. And you could also check there's no holes in the bag at all. Lucky penny for you. So, <laughs> so um, Donna, if this, if this half dollar can go through a plastic bag, maybe it can go through, like, my pocket. So nothing else in my, in my hands. One coin, I'm going to place that coin in my pocket. And I'm going to watch as it melts right through the fabric of my pocket. Ooh. And I thought, well, if I could, if I could uh, put that coin in this pocket, I could reach forward and make even more money appear. Now we have a dollar. Now I was thinking, this reminds me of, um, I was standing in line to buy a lottery ticket about a few years ago. Yeah, that's when the, a, a million dollars would have been a big jackpot. And I thought, what would it be like if I won a million dollars? I started daydreaming. Like, instead of a dollar, what if I was actually holding a million dollars? Like, what would it even feel like? Like, they probably wouldn't even have a president on it. Maybe they would have the Statue of Liberty on the face. Maybe on the back, like an iconic moment of history, like George Washington crossing the Delaware. I think, could they even fit all those zeros? You'd probably have to, like, make them really small in the corners. And I started dreaming all the good I could do if I just had a million dollars. And I heard this voice. He was like, sir, sir, can I help you? I went, oh, just um, one lottery ticket, please. <laughs> I guess we could all dream, can't we? So, <laughs> so that moment of wonder you feel right now, we all have the power to create. You don't need to be a magician, and you don't need a million dollars. See, I believe that wonder is one degree away. Just like heating water up to the boiling point, even a one degree micro shift on our daily actions can bring wonder to life, a smile, calling someone by name, a thoughtful nod in conversation that tells the other person, I hear you and I see you, a handwritten note. Just I should picture my daughter, Emma. <laughs> She's 15 now. She's three years old here. It's a memory of when we went to Disneyland. We got there early enough that we could order the breakfast. She wanted pancakes. I was watching the guy in the back. I can see through the window. And I thought, well, he's putting the pancakes really close together on that griddle. And they formed into like a Mickey Mouse shape. Flipped them over, put them on a plate. And that simple action, they delivered magic on a plate. They elevated Disney's brand. And they also created a memory we still talk about. And how much effort did it take? Nearly, nearly none. It's an example of a one degree micro shift. Today we're going to talk about how we all have that power to to uh, bring wonder to the world, some much needed wonder to the world through simple actions just like this. I've had conversations with over 100 community leaders and colleagues, and I've found that it's often those simple tweaks that have the biggest outcomes because we're building upon what we already know.
There's a great a quote by educator Walt Streitif that says, in the eyes of a child, there's no seven wonders of the world, there's seven million. But as we get older, that wonder gap widens, and I want to help fill it. As Emma continues to say, Dad, this isn't just your New Year's resolution, it's your New Year's revolution. <laughs> and she's absolutely right. Wonder's been a part of my life since uh, about seven years old. I would watch Doug Henning on TV. As an only child with a single mom, just the two of us. So magic was a wondrous escape for me. We lived on Hope Street near, near Los Angeles, and to me, magic was hope. And I'll start with this deck of cards. See, my mom had saved these from when she was a, a flight attendant with Western Airlines, years before I was born, years before she even dreamed of having a son. For some reason, she saved these and gave these to me, and little did she know that that simple act would propel me on a lifelong journey of sharing magic through all I do, not just as a magician, but as a nonprofit executive uh, and a philanthropist, as a brand builder and author, as a family man and a volunteer. There's magic in all of it. Now, I wasn't always so clear on this, and there was many years of my life where I, I felt scattered, pulled in different directions, like my interests in magic and art were competing against my interest in business and philanthropy. And then I realized, at an aha moment, I wasn't being pulled in different directions. I was being pulled in the same direction toward one common purpose. And then with that, effortlessly, my life mission poured out of me. It's just five words, but to me, they're everything. I connect people to the extraordinary. And then everything felt right in the world. So if you leave with anything today, I want you to think about all those various passions and interests you likely have. And instead of feeling pulled in different directions, get those arrows to turn inward toward one single purpose. You're going to find that for the things you love, it's not a matter of finding the time, it's finding the purpose. You came today as wonder seekers, but you're going to leave as wonder makers. But how? You can apply these one degree shifts in three areas that magicians across the globe use. I call these the, uh, the power of three. It's imagination, presentation, and connection. Each of these is important. Together, they are magic. Now, it all starts with imagination. We all use our imagination, imagination every day in one way or another. A little bit different for magicians. We don't just imagine what's possible. We imagine what's impossible. Great companies do this, too, with their mission statements, these bold and aspirational vision statements. Let's think about it, you know. Um, Apple's 1997 Think Different campaign, those who are crazy enough to think they could change the world are the ones who do, or Alzheimer's Association, a world without Alzheimer's. That's their vision. Hyundai's global vision, progress for humanity. So this is no time to be bland, it's a time to be bold. So in our daily lives, we can take that same approach. Invite others into an exciting and optimistic view of the future, and you could do it using just a few words, imagine if. I'll let you fill out the rest of the sentence. Imagine if, or imagine when, right? Let's try it now, let's imagine if you could take what you imagine and make it real. Imagine if you could take this deck of cards in my pocket and make it look invisible. For some of you, it's already working. <laughs> so I'm gonna toss this in the audience. I'll toss it over here, look for somebody to catch it. Who, who caught it? Oh, perfect, what's your name? Diana. Diana, do me a favor, take those invisible cards out of the box and take out any one card, okay? We're gonna form this card in real time. Diana, do you want the card to be red or black? Yeah. And out of all the red cards, there's hearts and diamonds, which one do you want it to be? And out of all the hearts in the deck, and it doesn't have to be a queen of hearts, it could be any one of the ace, a number card, a core card, which heart do you want it to be? I do want it to be the queen. You do? Fine with me. You can change your mind if you want. Okay. Here's a, just to make sure you don't change your mind, here's an invisible Sharpie. I want you to put a big X across the queen of hearts just to say this is your final answer. Turn the queen upside down, put it back in the deck so it's the only card facing the other direction. Fair enough, right? Here, here's an invisible rubber band you can put around everything just to keep it safe. Perfect. You could be a mime in real life. If it <laughs> <laughs> Toss the cards back to me on the count of three. Oh, you're fast. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, I think they landed back in my pocket. Wait a minute. I do have a deck of cards now with one rubber band around it. Now, you're all watching. Okay, wait. This is where the guy is going to do some fancy sleight of hand. I'm not. The card's out of the box. I guess you could have said the five of hearts. You could have said any one of these cards. There's one card, it's upside down, it's right here, but I'm gonna show you all the rest. <laughs> all these different cards you could have said, you have so many choices all on the way, but you landed on one card. Remind everybody, what card did you choose? Queen of hearts. Oh, the, oh, the queen of hearts. Shoot, it doesn't always work. 
but today it did, the Queen of Hearts. It's the only card upside down with an X on it as well. Thank you for sharing your imagination with me. I appreciate that. So now we could build upon imagination by going to a second uh, principle in magic, and that's called presentation. As magicians, we are inherently focused on presentation, right? as you can see. But in our daily lives, it's about bringing ideas to life. There's, uh, there's many ways to do this. I'm going to get to this angel's flight thing in a minute. But um, there's many ways to do this. Uh, when I was studying advertising in college, there's a, a book by Hank Seaton called Advertising Pure and Simple. And it can be summed up by a few words. Show me, don't tell me. So there's, next time you're talking about a trip you had with somebody, uh, don't just recite the play-by-play. -play. Reenact a highlight with a friend. Use props around the table. Doodle on a napkin. These are all fun, easy ways to elevate presentation. They say that knowledge is power. I think the real power is in the way we share knowledge, sharing it in a way that makes people lean forward with curiosity and interest. We can do this every day. I live near Los Angeles. There's a historic a trolley called Angel's Flight. I can go on and talk about it. It's been there since 1901. It's done 100 million rides. What's unique about it is it goes up and down Bunker Hill. It gives people a different view of LA. And also maybe it helps spark their interest in what LA used to be or what it could be. We can elevate presentation even more. Diane, I could use that rubber band that was around your deck a moment ago. Thank you. You're going to shoot it at me, I see. I already got it. <laughs> I'll use my wedding band, too. We're going to try to recreate Angel's Flight just for you now, just using presentation. So I'll put the rubber band through the, band, uh, through the ring. So we're going to try to make the ring move without even touching it. Here we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I can only make it go down, sorry. <laughs> the up part's a little hard. Maybe I can use your help. Maybe, may, imagine if we could all use the power of our mind to make the ring move up the band like Angel's Flight. Here we go. Just picture it happening and you see. We're just like real magic. There's a ring on the band. Look, strand by strand, I can pull it right up. Uh, this is a, you can see the ring on this side and this side as well, watch. Like a true angel's flight, it always comes back. <laughs> so anyway, so we focused on imagination. We focused on presentation. Now I realize presentation can be scary for some, right? Because it means stepping into the spotlight. It was for me too. I was a, I'm a member of the Magic Castle in Hollywood. It's a few miles from angel's flight private club, um, and when I joined, I was asked to perform there. My, all, my walls went up, no, I'm too scared, I, I, I live too far away, I, uh, I, it's not my schedule. But the truth was, yeah, I was, I was scared, I was scared of failure. I was also scared of just embracing the spotlight, until one day I decided just to step into fear. And you know what, it wasn't so bad. My friend Vince gave me a great piece of one degree advice, John, don't try to get rid of the butterflies, just get them to fly in formation. And that one bit of advice got me through my first show, through all 28 shows throughout the week, the most exhilarating feeling of my life. I remember after my last show, I ran up to Jack Goldfinger. He's the entertainment director who hired me. I said, Jack, I don't know why I waited so long. He said, John, that was just you getting in the way of you. Great advice. I've never let that happen again. So when it comes to presentation or any aspect of your life, don't let you get in the way of you. We often self-sabotage ourselves because we, we, that feeling of euphoria is uncommon for us, but learn to live in that a little bit more. This is a great couple I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, but this next, uh, next uh, part of this trilogy, this power three, is connection. Because at the end of the day, it's all about people, right? It's not about the props. It's about all of us now connected in some way. Many of us strangers before today now connected through the shared experience. You know, as magicians, we're focused on being audience-centric looking at things through your eyes. I'm also a fundraiser and a philanthropist, so I'm, I'm donor-centric. I look at things through the eyes of the donor to understand their values. And for us every day, it's about being people-centric, just simply taking a genuine interest in others. Imagine if tomorrow we all took a genuine interest in one person for one moment, the wonder we would bring to the world if we did that. I met this couple on a train ride um, across Europe I, I, on, on the way to Vienna. In 2017, I was traveling, do, performing and lecturing on magic. 
I realized right away we're not going to be able to communicate because they were speaking German. I speak English, so we sat right across in the booth and heads down for the first few miles. <laughs> and then I uh, remember I, like, kind of just fiddling with my cards a little bit. Just simple stuff, you know, just like dribbling through the cards, maybe a little cut. And I could tell that she was kind of looking my way, so I said, oh, maybe this is my chance. I reached for it. You know, the international symbol for pick a card, any card. <laughs> but her eyes, she, her, her hands went up, she looked away, she said, no, no. And I realized she probably thought I was a gambler or a swindler or something, so. <laughs> so then I went, okay, I'll just go back to my cards. So I, used some other, I remember shuffling the, the cards with one hand, something like this. Then I noticed they were both looking at me. They gave me a knowing, a knowing smile, and then we, I, that opened the door to do some magic. I remember they each chose a card, the cards changed places, his cards went in my pocket. But the real magic happened when I put the cards away, and we took out our phones, and we were showing pictures of our pets and of our families, of our homes. Uh, we were laughing every mile of the way, transcending any sort of language barrier. Time went by like that. We got to our final stop, about to get off the train and part ways. Gentleman faced me, he grabbed my hand, and he uttered five words in English. You are a wonderful man. I get choked up just thinking about it. And because in that moment, he was the magician. In that moment, he shared more magic than I ever could. And I realized then that we all have the power to bring wonder to the world, even through sim five simple words. We have one degree shifts that we can make every day. I want one final moment with all of you. Um, I only need a few cards. I'm just going to use three cards from this deck. They're all different. I don't want you to think I cheat. I mean, I do cheat. I just don't want you to think that I do. But <laughs> I'll, use the, I'll use the ace, two, and three. As ace, two, three. I'll try to find the ace just by feeling. I'm going to find it with one finger. One finger in the middle, I could probably find the ace of spades. Um, there's one. Um, the two I'm going to find by maybe splitting cards. You know, in Vegas, you split a hand of blackjack. I got that ace. We could split that into two. That's the ace and the two. The three I'm going to try to find by magic. I'll put the cards away. We have the ace. We have the two. I'm going to leave the space in there in between blank, just like that. If I reach in the air, I can put the three. <laughs> but you do have to use your imagination. The three is invisible. From this side, it's invisible. From your side, it's visible, which is kind of weird. As a matter of fact, wonder is closer than we think one, de one degree away. It even says the word wonder on the back. So I have three cards. And I'm going to invite you to do something with three cards. You all have three cards under your seat. So now's the time to grab them. And if anybody's watching this, any, wherever you are in the world right now, grab three cards. We're going to do something kind of interactive together, okay? <laughs> now you're wondering, that's what these cards are for. So they're all different. Um, make sure of that. You can mix them up a little bit. Start at a random spot, okay? In a minute, we're going to rip these cards in a very specific way, okay? So I'll guide you through it. So what I want you to do is we put a big crease down the middle. So fold the cards first this way as a group and then fold them back again this way. So you've got a big crease in the middle. I might move at a brisk pace, so just follow along, okay? So this crease is gonna make it easy to, to tear, so let's just start tearing it down the middle. And once you start a little bit, it'll be easy to do. Go all the way down the middle. And you're gonna have some halves in each hand. Put either half on top of the other, it doesn't matter. And I want you to hold that little packet like a little mini deck of cards. Y'all following along? You're still ripping. I don't wanna get ahead of anybody, but I'm gonna go on the next step soon. So hold on like a little mini deck of cards. Let's personalize it by spelling your name. I'll go first by putting one card at the bottom for each letter. So I'm John, so I'm going to go J-O-H-N. I'll let you do that now. This makes it unique to you. So now these cards are in a unique order based on your name. Here's another personal choice. I want you to think right now, what piece feels more lucky to me, the top piece or the bottom piece? You might make a different choice than the person next to you. It's okay. But whatever piece you're thinking of, the top or bottom, take that piece now. Don't even look at the identity of it. Just put it in a safe place. Maybe sit on it, okay? I'll put mine under my water right here, okay? Now, you're left with some cards, okay? Take whatever card's on top now. Think of something maybe stressful in your life, and I want you to get rid of it. Just let it flutter to the floor. We don't need it anymore. Whatever piece is on top now, I want you to take that and put it in the middle of your packet somewhere. It's somewhere in the middle. And whatever piece is on top now, put that on the bottom. Here's where it gets kind of fun. Whatever piece is on top now, I want you to change it with some, exchange it with somebody else. And here, I'll come down. You, you want to come up here and we'll exchange our pieces. Perfect. And get the other person's piece and put it in the middle of your packet, okay? 
You know, you did that so well, let's do it again. Take the next piece on top, exchange that with somebody else or the same person. It's up to you. Here, I'll exchange it with you. Do you want to come up to me? We'll exchange pieces. Perfect. Put their piece in the middle of your packet, okay? All right. Don't you all feel connected even more now? So now we're going to start eliminating pieces, almost like when you're little and you would take a petals off of a flower. So whatever piece is on top now, just get rid of it. The next piece put on the bottom. The next piece, get rid of it. Next piece on the bottom. Next piece, get rid of it. Because you're left with one piece. No one would know what piece you would end up with because you spelled your name, you chose either the top or bottom piece, you're exchanging it, so the match might be in front of you, somebody else might be holding it. But maybe you are more powerful than you ever thought you were. Not maybe, you are more powerful than you ever thought you were. Remember that piece you sat on? You really Take that out right now. <laughs> it's only gonna happen for a few of you, it's so possible. But if you, if you have a match, I want you to hold it up. I want you to hold it up and say wow, if you have a match. Hold it up and say wow. <laughs> Look at this, amazing. So you most certainly came in here as an audience of wonder seekers. You are now an army of wonder makers. I look forward to seeing you all on this one degree journey. And by the way, my time is about up right now. The stage is yours tomorrow. And remember, you don't need a spotlight. You are the spotlight. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, John. I'm sure we all enjoyed that one. Coming up next, our next speaker is Eden Strawn, a 2021 graduate of Ithaca College and a Park Scholar. Eden is now a published author with her book, Black Girls Don't Get Love. Eden's talk will discuss the lack of black female representation in the coming of age genre and how it, how it reflects the erasure of black girl girlhood in society. Without further ado, here's Eden with Who Gets to Be the Girl Next Door? Take a moment to think about the top coming-of-age films of the last three decades. Some of you might think of classics like Sixteen Candles, Juno, Lady Bird, or The Perks of Being a Wallflower. These films have our hearts because for many of us, these films shaped our understanding of what it meant to grow up and find ourselves. However, behind the nostalgia, these films all have one major fault. That is, these films completely disregard the experiences of black girls coming of age. Can anyone here think of a mainstream coming of age film that features a black female protagonist? Most of us can't. While there are coming of age films that feature black female protagonists such as Jezebel, Miss Juneteenth, and Solace, arguably, these films did not make it into the canon of great American coming of age films or achieve the same commercial success. Today, I'd like to argue that the lack of black female representation in the coming of age genre directly represents the erasure of black girlhood in mainstream society. If we think about it, black girls are usually not afforded the opportunity to be the girls next door or the ones who get to be young, wild, and free. Instead, black girls are often burdened with the responsibility of navigating adult-like issues. A great example of this is seen in the 2018 film, The Hate You Give. The film follows the life of 16-year-old Star Carter, a black female protagonist who is trying to navigate the awkward high school years while also trying to juggle her two identities of living in a predominantly black neighborhood that is stricken by poverty and crime and attending a predominantly white school in the suburbs. In the opening scenes of the film, we don't get to see white picket fences and sunshine like you might see in most other non-BIPOC teenage dramas. Instead, we see depressed, and homes and depressed homes and businesses that are clearly struggling to stay afloat. When we get to meet the cast, we meet a nine-year-old version of Star and her family as they sit at their home dining table discussing what to do if stopped by the police. Now when it happens, don't act mad, Star's dad Maverick says. You gotta look calm, keep your hands out of your pockets. If you drop something, 
leave that stuff where it's at. This raw and unpleasant conversation set the tone for the rest of the film. Clearly, this would not be a feel-good film about teenage adolescents. In the scenes following, we are introduced to Star's friends and love interests from both her predominantly black neighborhood and her school in the suburbs. One of Star's love interests is her childhood friend, Khalil Harris. Star narrates that the two shared their first kiss and formative years together in the predominantly black neighborhood of Garden Heights. However, unlike traditional coming-of-age films, we don't get to see their love story unfold. In fact, we only get to spend a total of 10 minutes with Star and Khalil until their love story is tragically interrupted by Khalil's murder by police, all because of a hairbrush the officer claimed was a gun. With Khalil's death as a catalyst for the rest of the film, Garden Heights erupts into a battleground for justice as yet another unarmed black man is shot and killed by the police. As the only witness to the murder, Star is, Star's childhood is interrupted as she is forced to become a witness in the case and become an advocate for social justice. Here, we get to see Star's childhood perpetuate the strong black woman trope as she is thrust into activism before truly being able to grieve her friend's death. To make matters worse, all of this happens on the backdrop of Star's high school prom season. The Hate You Give is an important film because it illustrates the nuances of race, gender, and police brutality in America. However, the difference between white-led coming-of-age films and The Hate You Give is that the majority of coming-of-age moments in this film were overshadowed by looming undertones of inevitable violence. Some might push back in this argument and say that The, coming of age, um, the Hate You Give was never meant to be a coming-of-age film. But the thing is, do we ever make police brutality-centered films for young white audiences? We don't. White coming-of-age films are about the best parts of growing up. Like in Say Anything, when John Cusack's character Lloyd holds a boombox above his head and serenades his valedictory love interest, Diane. Or in The Perks of Being a Wallflower, when Emma Watson's character, Sam, stands at the back of a pickup truck as they listen to David Bowie's Heroes, and her friend Patrick drives him through the Fort Pitt Tunnel. These were some of the most iconic moments in the coming-of-age genre. And when we juxtapose them to The Hate You Give, we don't get any of that nostalgia back. Instead, The Hate You Give forces black audiences to relive the worst parts of being black on screen. So even with a star-studded film and a black female lead, this film missed the mark, and the box office numbers reflect that. When we see white film characters enjoying the blissfulness of youth, smoking weed, attending prom, skipping school, and falling in love, we see them as kids being kids. In contrast, when we see black film characters portrayed as gangsters, drug dealers, and prostitutes, we see them, black kids, as criminals, and we are conditioned to see them as more mature. These media representations are harmful because they create an adultification bias towards black kids. In 2017, the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality released, released Girlhood Interrupted, a study that proved that adults view black girls as more mature than their white peers, especially in the age range of five to 14. The study found that compared to white girls of the same age, black girls needed less nurturing, they needed less protection, that they needed to be supported less, that they needed to be comforted less, that black girls were more independent, and that black girls knew more about adult-like topics, like sex. Georgetown Law Center argued that the study's findings revealed a potential contributing factor in the disproportionate rates of punitive treatment of black girls in the educational and juvenile justice system. In another study conducted by the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media, black women and girls are 6.5% of the US population, but only 3.7% of leads and co-leads in the top 100 grossing films of the last decade. This study has improved, this figure has improved in recent years. Additionally, only one in five black leading ladies from the past decade have a dark skin tone. And lastly, 57.1% of black female leads in the past decade were depicted with hairstyles that conform to European standards of beauty as opposed to natural black hairstyles. 
The title of this talk is Phrase as a Question. Who gets to be the girl next door? As a young girl, I frequently wondered if I would ever have the same coming of age moments that I saw depicted in the movies. I dreamed about these moments longingly, but just as coming of age films that featured black female protagonists were non-existent, so was my own coming of age story. As an author, filmmaker, and producer, I'm committed to, to telling stories that positively center the experiences of black women and girls. And that's why I founded Black Girls Don't Get Love, a multimedia coming of age brand for girls of color. At Black Girls Don't Get Love, our mission is to use media to turn silence into language and change the way black women and girls are perceived in society. Earlier this year, I published the Black Girls Don't Get Love book, a coming of age story about a black high school girl who is dealing with feelings of insecurity due to Eurocentric beauty standards. Right now, my team and I are currently fundraising to turn the Black Girls Don't Get Love book into a movie for a streaming or theatrical release. I do this work because I never want another black girl to wonder if she can too come of age. Today, I'd like to invite you on this journey with me of changing the coming of age narrative, not just in media representations, but in everyday life. We need to allow black girls the opportunity to enjoy their youth. We need to protect black girls from over-sexualization and adultification. We need to provide black girls with the resources they need to succeed. This work takes all of us, but I'm confident that if we are intentional about creating the changes we wish to see, black girls will too have the opportunity to be the girls next door. Thank you. Thank you, Eden. That was a really inspirational talk. Coming up next is Nyjah Young. Nyjah is a journalism student here at Ithaca College, and today she will be talking to us about how internalizing academic pressures warped her perception of self for the worse. In her talk, Nyjah will be defining self-worth and success in a world that glorifies productivity, presenting self-acceptance in an age of self-optimization. One day in October of 2018, one month into my senior year of high school, the top 10 students of our graduating senior class were announced over the loudspeaker. I was sitting in AP Calculus AB, my last class of the day, and I listened with my heart racing and my jaw clenched as I heard our principal announce the top 10 students with the highest GPAs in our graduating class. After minutes that felt like they could have been hours, I heard my name. I had done it. I was valedictorian of my senior class, and I was elated on top of the world for about the 30 minutes that it took for me to call my parents and get home and be greeted with balloons from my dad and a note of congratulations from my sister. I think more than anything, I was just relieved that it was all over. And then I had this awful sinking feeling. This was the start of a series of realizations that maybe the past four years of my life, the sweat, tears, and anxiety attacks, actually may have not been worth it, or just not nearly as much as I'd hoped. Where had I gone wrong along the way? From childhood, we're taught to tether our productivity levels, our grades in class, the jobs that we do, to who we are as people and our self-worth. And for those of us who tether these things too closely together, the consequences can be detrimental to our mental health. I'll be using myself as a sort of case study. So we're backtracking a bit. 
Since childhood, my parents instilled within my sister and I the importance of an education. Doing well in school was a big key to a bright future. And so hopefully the more work we did now meant the less we'd have to do when we got out. I'm not saying that my parents laid the foundation for the toxic and complicated relationship that I now have with work. I'm saying that as I've grown up, how I performed in a classroom defined most, if not all, of who I was. I thrived off the positive reinforcement, the external validation of good grades, awards, compliments, and so on. I was a student before anything else. The mindset that I was developing, some may know it as grind culture, hustle culture, the idea that one must work beyond their emotional, mental, and physical capacity to fulfill some definition of success in a career. And I thought that in order to do so, I had to optimize my time. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines optimize as a verb, meaning to make as perfect, functional, and effective as possible. In short, I was working like a robot, a machine, in order to strive toward what I thought would be fulfillment. But behind closed doors, I was actually really struggling. I rarely slept through the night, sometimes, or oftentimes, skipped breakfast, sometimes skipped lunch during the school day to get more work done. I was working beyond my means and got used to taking the path of most resistance, taking classes that were really hard, but that I sometimes had no real interest in because they looked good to friends, family, and faculty, and they would look good for colleges as well. I didn't know why I did it until now, I guess, but I wasn't taking very good care of myself and I was hoping it would be worth it in the end if I could just hold on to this goal. Hopefully the benefits would outweigh the costs. My junior year of high school, I experienced what I now refer to as the first serious depressive episode I had. I was taking four AP classes and balancing extracurriculars, a much heavier workload than I had had in the years prior. The upperclassmen at my school had told me that junior year was the last year that got factored into our class rank, our GPAs, and so to me, it mattered the most. So 16-year-old Nija walked into fall of 2017, weary of the journey ahead. I just don't think I could have predicted how much the winter months transformed everything about me. I watched my everyday routines transform before my very eyes. I started to dread getting up for classes in the morning. I was fatigued and agitated with myself and others. And I struggled with suicidal thoughts. I didn't reach out for help as much as I should have in retrospect because I was so afraid of what friends, family, and faculty would think of me, of how their views of me would change. I was ashamed, embarrassed, but I think most of all, I was just frustrated with myself. How could I be doing so much and seemingly accomplishing so little? How could all of this be happening to me? at what seemed like such a pivotal time in my academic career. Nothing made sense. I was doing all the work, or so I thought. And depression, of course, convinced me that I was the problem. I don't mean for my experience to convey that optimization, hustle culture, that these things don't have any place in my life or society at large. These things can be very necessary and useful. The grades that I got in high school made my college applications more attractive. I was able to form amicable bonds with the teachers at my school. And when I got here, I had accumulated a good amount of credits to start out my time. The issue became that this way of life that I developed became my every day. My habits were no longer productive, they were destructive, and so I burned out year after year with no concept of rest. How I was living just wasn't sustainable. And I think that more people of today are waking up to that fact. 
The Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported in 2019 that one in three high school students had persistent feelings of hopelessness, sadness. This was the same year that I graduated from high school and I probably didn't really realize it in the moment, but I wasn't alone at all in how I was feeling. These feelings of sadness and hopelessness are sometimes connected to depression and can oftentimes be connected to other issues that negatively impact mental health and self-esteem, like imposter syndrome, the constant feeling that one is underqualified, undeserving of great job opportunities or even healthy and worthwhile relationships, or perfectionism, which Brown University's Counseling and Psychological Services defines as a set of self-defeating thoughts and behaviors aimed at achieving excessively high, unrealistic goals. I was looking at a journal I'd kept during my senior year, and I found some recurring thoughts and feelings. Feelings of overwhelm, the fear of disappointing people, and the thought that I should be happy even though I wasn't. I wasn't alone in these feelings, but I didn't realize it at the time. And so as I moved through school, I felt that I was alone. I didn't reach out for help. I thought that becoming valedictorian would prove something. I think that my younger self was hoping to prove that I mattered because for so long I thought that to be successful was to be worthy of love, of happiness and rest, of life in general, and it's taken me years to figure out that I was wrong. If anything, I'm still figuring out that I was wrong. And so I'm taking the steps. I'm learning to set boundaries between myself and the work that I do because I have to believe that I'm enough as I am for who I am, not just the work that I do. I'm becoming more transparent with friends and family and faculty about how I'm feeling. I'm understanding that I deserve sleep. <laughs> Not just because I worked hard enough to earn it in a day, but because I need and deserve it regardless of what I've done. And that handing in an assignment late, receiving a grade that I'm not happy with, doesn't make me a bad student or a bad person. The life that I've been living for so long, assignment to assignment, deadline to deadline, isn't the one I want anymore. And I'm realizing it's not too late to change that. And so redirecting to me is about choosing oneself. It's about choosing ourselves even when societal expectations or even the little voice in our heads <laughs> tells us that we shouldn't. It's directing time and energy back to rest and recreation, rediscovering hobbies I loved as a kid that still make me very happy now. It's about spending time with family and friends, cultivating these relationships. These are the things that I want to matter most in my life, and I don't want to miss out on them anymore. In, oh, this is a quote from my journal, actually. For so long, I thought that this was what I wanted, ranking number one in my class. And I'm realizing now that maybe this just wasn't true. I didn't want the accomplishment, I wanted the acceptance. In October of 2018 is when I found out that I ranked number one in my class. And in November of 2018, I turned 17 years old. At that point, it didn't feel like I would make it to my 18th birthday. And today, two weeks from today, I'll be turning 21. I hope that when the time arises, we all have the ability to redirect in our own ways. Because people deserve to be loved and to rest and to safeguard their well-being and sense of self without having to work so endlessly to prove it first. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Nigel. That was incredible. Next up is Maureen Divine All, author of How to Make the Matriarchy, The Power and Promise of Prioritizing Women. Maureen graduated from Ithaca College in 2003, and today she will be talking to us about how empowering women doesn't go far enough. She believes women need prioritization rather than empowerment. Here is Maureen with her talk titled, Why Empowering Women is Failing Women. If you had asked me just a few years ago what I felt about the idea of empowering women and girls, I would have told you I was 100% all in, no questions asked. Empowered women empower women, right? Girl power. I had seen and experienced these themes in practice, and I was all for them. But it was an incident at my daughter's school that caused me to question what I really knew about lifting up women and girls. It caused me to question the relationship between empowerment and injustice. When my daughter was in second grade, she came home with an assignment to dress up and emulate as a historical figure for a wax museum us parents would be invited to visit. The assignment came home with this list of historical figures to choose from. As you can see, my daughter circled the name she was angling for. And as any parent might do, I tried to figure out why she circled these names in particular. It took me a minute at the time, and you probably already see it, but I eventually realized my daughter circled who she thought to be the women on the list. I then quickly realized that on this list of 10 names to choose from, only two choices were women. I thought surely this was short-sighted and a simple fix. So I reached out to the school principal, politely, to ask if we could add a few more female historical figures for the kids to choose from. She told me that while she and the teachers saw the same imbalance, that they, and shared my frustration, that this list was extracted directly from the history and social studies curriculum in the state of Virginia where I live. Ultimately, she told me that the list attached to this assignment wasn't up for change or debate because it was the list that was in the curriculum. My daughter went on to play a cute and well-researched Helen Keller as did probably 50% of the girls in her class. I went on to wonder, if this is what the list looks like in second grade, what do the rest of the grades look like? There was only one way to find out, and that was by reviewing the entire K through 12 history curriculum. I recruited a partner, and together we read that curriculum, and we counted every reference of a proper name of a man or woman. By the time we were done, we found male historical figures were cited 1,008 times, while female historical figures were cited just 105 times. Yes, in this 21st century classroom, women still accounted for just one out of every 10 names referenced in the entire K through 12 history and social studies curriculum. So how did this change my relationship with the concept of empowerment? Merriam-Webster defines empowerment as being granted power, rights, or authority to do something. So by that definition, when applied to empowering women and girls, we're saying only once they've been given power, rights, and authority is the world theirs for the taking. This is why I believe empowering women is failing women. Empowerment puts the onus on women and girls to graciously accept the power and rights being granted to them to better their position in the world. All the while, potentially distracting us from the injustice that took away their power in the first place. This incident at my daughter's school showed me that while I could empower her to see beyond the limited worldview prescribed in that curriculum, that would do nothing to address the fact that what she needed to be met with was a better curriculum and to be met by teachers and administrators who weren't willing to accept the status quo. This incident, as simple as it may seem, was a significant wake-up call for me. It's what I call one of life's speed bumps. It jolted me out of cruising speed. It forced me to slow down and take greater notice of my surroundings. It caused me to wonder what else I was missing. So I set out on a learning journey. I learned a lot, 
but notably I learned women and girls have power and authority in some important ways. Women have power in numbers. We make up slightly more than half of the population on this planet. Women have power in the economy. In the US, they direct 83% of all buying power and influence. Women have power in knowledge, making up two-thirds of people enrolled in post-secondary education and graduating four years of higher education at nearly twice the rate men do. The more I learned, the more I came to challenge my long-held belief that empowerment was the way to a better future for women and girls. Instead, I came to believe that true transformation is possible when women are prioritized. When the barriers they face are demolished by those who hold the power to do so, instead of giving women power and authority to attempt to overcome them. It was a particular story on my learning journey that shifted me towards this idea that prioritization is where true transformation takes place. When I share this story, I like to start with a quiz. So, if I were to ask you, as of March 2022, which of these countries is number one in the world for the number of women represented in their legislative bodies? Think Congress and Parliament. How many of you, by a show of hands, would choose Iceland? How many of you would choose New Zealand? It's a good guess. How many of you would choose Rwanda? For those of you who choose Rwanda, you get today's gold star. As of March 2022, women hold approximately 55% of seats in Rwanda's national legislatures. Cuba comes in a close second with 53%, followed later by Iceland and New Zealand, and much later by the US, with just 27% of our seats held by women. In 2008, Rwanda was the first country in the world to elect a majority female parliament, and they have held the top spot ever since. Now, you may be saying, Maureen, that's not a story of prioritization. That's a story of process of elimination. And to a point, that is true. Women and girls experienced a horrific genocide in 1994. The whole country did. In the span of just 100 days, the genocide left more than 800,000 people dead and another two million fleeing for their lives. When the violence eventually ended, records estimated that of Rwanda's remaining population of roughly six million, anywhere from 60 to 80% of those people remaining were women. So, for the country to rebuild, it would have to do so with the predominantly female population that remained. So, how did they do that? Rwanda, in 2003, uh, just nine years after the genocide, passed a new constitution. With the help of women leaders, this new constitution enshrined equality between women and men, most notably establishing a quota requiring a minimum 30% of parliamentary seats be held for women. Rwanda's president embraced and promoted the important role women had played in rebuilding their country. And he made clear how critical it was women continue to be included in important ways. He struck the vision, the country embraced it, using the power of their votes to go beyond the 30% minimum required, instead electing women to 64% of parliamentary seats. Or as I like to see it, the country prioritized women. The full story of Rwandan women is not mine to tell. I wasn't there, and I am not an expert in Rwandan history. So my somewhat rosy interpretation is likely short-sighted. But what is my story to tell is the impact reading about Rwandan women had on me. Reading about Rwandan women and the history and transformation filled me with hope. To see a country so dramatically transformed in a relatively short amount of time showed me that rapid progress is possible when women are prioritized. When the people who hold the power to take down the barriers they face do it, they demolish them, instead of giving women power and authority to attempt to overcome them.
And as it turns out, prioritizing women isn't just a win for other women. In the last two decades, the World Bank has found that Rwanda has experienced significant improvements in living standards, including strong economic growth, increased life expectancy, and decreased rates of poverty. This theory of prioritization plays out in other countries as well. In 2019, researchers in Canada set out to understand the relationship between women in leadership and public health. They found that as the number of women in leadership increased, the country's mortality rates decreased. A 2012 study out of UC Berkeley found that companies with more women on their boards were more likely to invest in renewable power, more likely to implement carbon reduction programs, and more likely to reduce the environmental effects of production and packaging. More and more data and studies show that where women are prioritized, they don't just make life better for other women, they make life better for everyone. Clearly, I have developed a passion for prioritizing women as a, as a strategy to a better world. But back to this tricky topic of empowerment. There is a place for empowerment in the hard work of the world. But I have come to understand that empowerment is the work that comes after injustice. As long as there are injustices robbing women and girls of power and authority, we need empowerment efforts to restore and overcome. But I believe that prioritization is a strategy to prevent injustice from happening in the first place. So you may be wondering, what does prioritization look like in practice? Well, it looks like the 28 countries around the world who recognized giving women power and authority to run for office isn't enough. They have opted to prioritize women by passing legislation requiring a quota anywhere from 30%, like in Rwanda, to 50% in Mexico be reserved for women. It looked like the state of California recognizing that empowering women to seek seats on corporate boards puts the onus on women to bust through the barriers. They have opted to prioritize women by passing legislation requiring corporations to reserve a minimum number of seats. Now, both of those examples happened at legislative levels. But there are three simple ways you and I as individuals can support and enable the transformative power of prioritization. First, get curious when you encounter empowerment efforts. Evolve, as I have, beyond immediate unflinching sport, support to instead pausing and searching for the root issue that took away power in the first place. When you find that root issue, you find the opportunity for prioritization. Second, be willing to challenge what you believe to be true. A world where women and girls are prioritized is not one many of us ever have lived in. But opportunities are abound to leverage the transformative power of prioritization in each of our spheres of influence and in so many challenges the world faces today. Closing wage and wealth gaps, improving women's health, and preventing domestic and sexual violence. In fact, once you're willing to shift your thinking, it's hard not to see the opportunities we each have in our world. And third, well, third comes with a word of caution. When you begin to more thoroughly examine the status of women and girls in the world, it's very easy to lose hope. There is no shortage of stories in the world today where women aren't being prioritized or empowered. And so third, refuse. Refuse to let those stories rob you of the opportunity to be inspired. Inspired by the places in the world giving us brilliant examples of what we all stand to gain when we leverage the transformative power of prioritization. It's those places and stories that keep me connected to hope and inspire me to break down barriers where I can. From the halls of Congress 
to the halls of my daughter's elementary school. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Our final speaker for the day is Jen Rafferty. Jen, an 06 and 09 graduate from Ithaca College, is an educator and CEO from Cortland, New York. Jen believes that educators should recognize their burnout and put themselves first. She argues that in doing so, students will learn from them and pick up better behavior surrounding stress. Without further ado, here's Jen with her talk, Generational Change Begins with Empowered Teachers. wanted to be a teacher. In fact, teaching felt more like a calling than a choice, like it chose me. And teaching music was really the only thing that I wanted to do because when I was a student, music class was the place where I felt like I belonged, where I felt comfortable and confident. And my music teachers taught me the importance of sharing music as a way to connect with other people and as a way to elevate humanity with something beautiful. I couldn't wait to get into my own classroom and inspire people, especially young people, to discover their voice. I mean, this is how I was going to change the world. And like so many teachers, my career became more than just a job. It became a part of who I was, and it still is a part of who I am. Because here's the thing, teachers have the most important job in the world. You lay a foundation for every other career. You inspire curiosity and ignite passion. You embolden creative thinkers and you foster a love of learning and you propel new generations and that's just in your day job. So for all of you teachers out there watching today, we are going to celebrate you because you are a big deal and we are creating big impacts on the kids we work with every day. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And because of your deep commitment to your profession, it becomes a part of your identity, which is amazing. But it's also where we start to lose ourselves and our identities beyond being a teacher. And when we look at how teachers are praised and revered for being selfless, constantly giving of self, I start to wonder, when is it acceptable to lose one's sense of self? And how is it impacting our students? The truth is you can't give something you don't have. So if you don't have a sense of self or a sense of intentions, boundaries, or personal priorities, then what do you have to give? And not just to your students and your colleagues, but to your families and the people at home, to your pets, and even your plants. And consistently trying to pour from an empty vessel just generates feelings of resentment and frustration. And to add to it, teachers face the stress of ever-changing school initiatives and state mandates, safety protocols, active shooter drills, laws about curriculum, last-minute schedule changes, oh, and not to mention actually teaching your content. And it just seems as if the proverbial plates are never big enough and they are perpetually overflowing. This is not a narrative that's sustainable. Feeling frustrated and depleted is not what you signed up for. And it can be really easy to feel the need to just push through and carry on because we're doing it for the kids. But if we were to be really honest about this, this is not okay. The teachers are not okay. The administrators are not okay. And this is not how we maintain high standards of education for our children, nor how we maintain a longevity in this career. So we're gonna be busting up some disempowering ideas about what it means to be a teacher so we can start having a very important conversation and move forward so you can get back to having the massive impact that you said that you wanted to make when you first started teaching. So first of all, teachers are not superheroes. Now, I know that this is an unpopular opinion, but just hear me out. Teachers are heroes, definitely. 
but they are human heroes. Superheroes have no regard for their own well-being. You never hear Superman saying, hey guys, I know the world is on fire and everything, but I really need to take some me time for today. And when we make the comparison to these immortal and indestructible superheroes, we forget that teachers are people. People with incredibly big hearts, but human nonetheless, who need to actually take care of themselves. So what if we flipped the script about selflessness and changed the story? What if instead we embraced and embodied the idea that the most generous thing you can do for your students is take care of yourself. And now I know this seems like a radical idea, especially in education, and some people ask me, well, Jen, if we're focused on ourselves all the time, then what about the kids? And that's a great question. What about the kids? Well, first, we need to consider what we're modeling for our students. What are the messages that they are actually receiving when they see all of the adults in their lives living with frustration and burnout and perpetual stress, yet pushing through and carrying on in the name of selflessness and martyrdom. We are teaching our kids how to live a life that normalizes burnout. And secondly, when we are feeling this way, we don't have the capacity to hold space for our students, especially when they need us most. So what does taking care of yourself even mean? Well, I wanna take a look at this through the lens of cognitive neuroscience, so you can see what's going on in your brain when you are experiencing all of this stress, which affects the way you perceive and experience the world. So this is your amygdala. Now this is the part of your brain that's responsible for your stress response of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And it hasn't really evolved much since the days that we were hunting and gathering and being chased by bears. So even though you may be doing something that seems harmless, like having a difficult conversation, or trying something new, your brain thinks you're in danger and you're going to die. <laughs> and as a part of that stress response, because now we're in survival mode, it cuts off any access to unnecessary parts of our brain for survival, like your prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of your brain that's responsible for higher order thinking, like organizing and prioritizing and problem solving and creativity. So, if your mind and your body think you're in danger and going to be mauled by a bear, how can we show up and do the things that we say we want to do? How can a teacher stand in front of their class and inspire their students without creativity and problem solving and organizing? How can we teach if we are being chased by a bear? We can't. And this stress has become chronic. Many of us wake up feeling activated. So if we want to become empowered in our lives, both at home and at school and work, we need to get rid of the bear. But it's not really a bear, right? It's stress and worry of all of the expectations and obligations, and it's anxiety of all of the things that are out of our control. So in order for you to tell if you are activated into this survival state, is by noticing what's going on in your body. I mean, we all know what it's like to feel stressed out, right? Our stomach is tight, our muscles tense up, our heart rate gets really fast, our headaches, or if you're me, you sweat a lot. <laughs> and our bodies talk to us all the time. But we are terrible listeners. And in an effort to just keep going and carrying on, we ignore the signs. And we just keep doing what we're doing because we're doing it for the kids. But how are we actually showing up when we are feeling this way? We're irritable and impatient, and we're resentful and exhausted, and eventually, we get sick. So we need to pay attention to our body and take care of ourselves. And now, the self-care that I'm talking about right now is not bubble baths and massages and taking a mental health day. And while those things are great, <laughs> they do not get to the core of sustainable well-being. We need to practice strategies of self-awareness and self-regulation in real time so we can make conscious choices of how we wanna show up as our best selves. Otherwise, we're just having subconscious knee-jerk reactions to everything that happens to us throughout the day because we're just trying to survive. 
So one of the simplest ways to move your nervous system from a sense of survival to a sense of safety is by breathing. And now I'm sure all of you have been breathing very successfully your whole lives, which is awesome. But this type of intentional breathing serves a much different purpose. And when we just take a few moments and pay attention to our breath, you start to notice that your heart rate slows down. You become more focused. I'm even feeling more relaxed, which is pretty amazing considering I'm up here doing a TED talk. <laughs> and breathing is just one of the many ways that you can regulate. You can move. Anytime we move our body, we are going to change our emotional state. So go for a walk. Dance, sing, that's my favorite, just sing. <laughs> or when the circumstances are right, get into your car, roll up your windows, and just let out a big releasing scream. When was the last time you did that? But you need to do something with your body because that's where the feelings are. And while deep breathing and cathartic screaming feel relaxing, the heart of this exercise is nervous system regulation, so you can get rid of the bear. Or if the bear is still there, it looks like this now. Right? <laughs> and I also need to say this too. We're not changing the world with deep breathing. That's ridiculous. There are very serious problems in the organizational structures within our school systems that are very real. However, at the very least, we need to come from a place where we have access to the part of the brain that we need in order to solve the problems. If we can't even think clearly, how can we make effective change? Or ask for what we want? Or advocate for our students? Which is why you need to start with yourself. Strengthen your notice muscle and regulate. Breathe. Honor your beautiful biology that is working so hard to do its job to keep you alive. Which, by the way, it's doing great because you're all here right now. And breathe again. And when you need to let it out, which we all do, make it safe to cry. Feel through your emotions and honor the most beautiful thing of what it means to be human. Our children are watching us. What if instead they had examples of all of the adults in their lives managing and processing their emotions in ways that was healthy and safe and productive? When you do this, how would you show up to that difficult conversation or engage with that challenging student? And one of the best things about this is that this doesn't have to be a solo activity. When I was teaching, middle school choir and I'd have 70 or 80 middle school students in front of me and I felt activated or I knew that they were, we would just take a few moments to breathe. And I'll tell you, those classes were some of the most productive because I was available. I could respond. I could problem solve and be creative. And so could they. So in a system that reveres selflessness, we must remember that the most generous thing you can do for your students is take care of yourself. Empowered teachers empower their students. And this is how we are going to make generational change that will transform our school cultures and the communities we serve. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Jen. Um, and thank you once again to all of our incredible speakers today. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Camille. Um, I'm the president of TEDx Ithaca College. And so I, I'm so happy you all could join us today. And before we wrap up the third ever uh, TEDx Ithaca College event, uh, we just wanted to say a few more thank yous. And I'm going to speak on behalf of our um, e-board here. So this event would not have been possible without the help of conference and event services. So Rachel Ash, Peter Olario, all of our student staff here today, Joe up in the booth, all of our 
other AV techs, thank you for being here. Um, our advisor, Mark, he's great. We asked him to do this with us, and thank you. Um, the live events production class, thank you. All of these people behind cameras and all the videos are being produced by students and students only, and I think that's very important. Um, I think student-led things are very important, um, learning by doing this experiential learning. So thank you guys. Also specifically Thomas Kerrigan, he's back in the booth, but awesome. Um, we talked briefly with the 2017 organizing team. So Grace Hennigan, 2017 organizing team, you guys were great, awesome. Thank you again, uh, the Student Governance Council and the Appropriations Committee for funding our event today, uh, and the Campus Center Operations staff for setting this up, taking this down for us. All of our incredible, spe incredible speakers, once again, thank you. This obviously would not have been possible without you. Um, yeah. All of our attendees, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching the live stream, we have a lot of people in the live stream, so that's cool. So thanks for that. Um, and our photographers, Isaac and Jacob, thank you for giving up your Saturday. Um, Jess for live tweeting, um, picking on the TEDx Ithaca College account, picking out some really, really amazing quotes. So go look back at that. You should follow us. I'm not sure how active we're going to be anymore, but you should follow us anyway. Um, the Ithacan and WICB for giving us some awesome promotional coverage. The Alumni and Family Engagement Team, the Office of Student Engagement, the Office of Print Production, uh, the Park School of Communications, and Ithaca College Marketing and Creative Group, all for pushing out our information, helping us set this up. And last but not least, thanks to the eBoard. Um, literally, a uh, fun fact, I was abroad last semester, and they held this fort down while I was gone, and we did meetings on Zoom with a five-hour time difference. So um, they really, really kept this running, and I'm really proud of them, and I'm happy that we were able to do this for you and for the Ithaca College community. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, we'll see you soon.